two, one. Hello and welcome to another podcast of The Gray Shame. Um, this is episode number 40. What we're doing is going through the Crowley family case murders that took place uh, in Apple Valley, Minnesota. And we're going through the book authored by Greg Fernandez Jr. called The Gray Stage. The Gray Stage. The Gray Stage by Greg Fernandez Jr. I think I started off by saying a gray shame. We also call it that, but it's also, so the gray stage is the book. And so the what we're covering today is, is on episode number 40. We're on page 167, if you're following along in the book. Page 167, and this is chapter number uh, 16. We're joined with uh, five folks today, including Greg Fernandez Jr., the author. Uh, Catherine Michelle is here with us today. Also, Matthew Nikolai, uh, retired infantry sergeant. Welcome, Matthew. You'll be able to shed some light um, uh, as far as David is serving in the military uh, uh, with him. And also Stephen Sanziri joins us today. Welcome, Stephen. Hey, thank you, Dan and everybody. And Stephen's the author of The Ultimate Prey, the book called The Ultimate Prey, the Yosemite uh, murders that took place in Yosemite. And uh, that's another very good book tying back almost to this one. No connection, but very similar as far as um, the strange uh, response uh, by law enforcement, strange response by uh, the various law enforcement agencies to, uh, to um, you know, potentially uh, clean up and fix and, um, you know, solve a murder, but yet we don't have it when the evidence is actually uh, there. It's uh, so... Good, good book there. If you get a chance to read the Yosemite uh, murders, but um, how are you doing today, Greg? I'm doing very well, thank you, my friend. Always a beautiful day. So, Greg, this is chapter 16, the the lengthiest. It's the final chapter, final chapter of the book. It's it's 50 pages. This chapter uh, runs through, and it's a it's a good culmination of everything in this book. Once again, if you want to follow anything on this Crowley case, uh, the best book out there currently is the Gray Stage that Greg wrote. Um, there is no opinions in this in this book. Um, it's it's just all laid out in facts and anything that it says uh, it's and states it's backed up by the support of where the reporter was pulled from uh, the quote it was made by. Uh, it, it's just a straightforward book that uh, allows you to come to your own conclusion. And so we're going to be starting off today with page 167. What we'll do is I will read the uh, the book. Basically, these series of podcasts are an audio book. And we'll read uh, several paragraphs and then a comment and elaborate on each thing. So, so make sure that the listener listening uh, has a full grasp and understanding of what it is we're talking about. So they're not assuming anything. Is everyone ready to start? It's a good, we've got a good episode, guys. Absolutely. Justice for Jamie. Amen. So this is the bottom of page 167 if you're following along. If you're watching it live, you'll see it there on your screen. Uh, continuing on, it says, when David graduated from college in 2009... Mr. Alam, now this is Kamel's dad, bought David a gray Toyota Corolla LE, possibly a 2004 model. Around the end of May 2014, according to a family friend of the Alams, Mr. Alam, quote, allowed David and Kamel to, to bring up his Acura passenger car so that they could use that to get around since they needed a vehicle. So uh, this is 2009, a young couple here. Um, just recently married, moving, uh, moved up to the Twin Cities in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Needed a car. Uh, Mr. Alam uh, always got along good with David and and Kamel. Um, said, "Here, here's a car. You can use that to get around until you get yourselves on your feet." Continuing on, it says Sidra's plan. Now, this is the sister. This is Kamel's sister, Sidra, who was living in Texas at the time. Her plan was to drive the black 2015 Toyota to her sister up in Apple Valley and take back her dad's Acura. Sidra walked into the lobby of the Apple Valley Police Department on October 18th, 2014 at 7.08 a.m. and spoke with Officer Karen Shaw, unit number 4918. According to the incident uh, recall report, quote, comp states her father sent her up here from Waco, Texas to swap cars with her sister now her sister won't answer the front door uh, or will, will not answer the door or phone once assistance getting father's car back. I advised comp this is a civil issue since her father gave her sister the car and would need to take her to civil court, uh, civil court, end quote. So 
what we've got here is a a series of things. So, so well, we got a typo first of all <laughs> that I put in there because um, I did say Citrus' plan was to drive the black 2015, but that should say 2005 Toyota. Um, that's the and uh, yeah. So, but was this 708 AM, Greg? Um, yeah. So if I got the timing right, because I know we have that in information okay. so i should have pulled it from from there that seems that seems early i know they they that said that she drove up and then went to the house they weren't either went first to the police department that's right um and it says here that, that they didn't let her in uh, or didn't answer the door but i think she stopped first uh, at at the police department she wanted to give them a heads up in case something happened at the site and so she wanted to have a heads up saying that she took due diligence and, and in good faith it was going to the police department to say, you know what, I want to make sure everything's on the up and up here when I go retrieve this, retrieve this car. And basically the officer just says, you know, go, go there and deal with the situation. If something comes from it, we'll get involved. But at, right now it's a civil case, a civil issue uh, right now. Yeah, any I think the other. Uh, yeah, the, do you have any? Okay. Let me just say one thing here again, because the other thing was the. Um, uh, the when gravy when David graduated from college in 2009, Mr. Lom bought him a gray Toyota Corolla, possibly 2004. That may be a, a 2005 too. So I had okay. to write possibly there. So there's just so many different things with this cars that I just kept getting thrown off on and just trying to figure out. So we have we have a gray Toyota, we have a black Toyota, then we have Dave, uh, then we have Kamel's father one of Kamel's father's cars so those are the three cars that are involved in this here go ahead Kathy. um on the actual police report um, little doodad thingy that we have it says that she went in there at 1908 so it was 708 p.m not mm, 708 okay. p.m so now another that, typo yeah that makes sense because uh, they did drive uh up the whole way and she was with her fiance Vinny at the time and by the time they got there I think they went to the Mall of America, which is in Bloomington, close by, that largest mall in America, just as a side note. Uh, big parking, lots of places. Just, she went there and just settled herself down. Uh, they went and just parked, and I think just they were amped up as far as they did not know what to expect. And when I got the information got it uh, from her is when I got this from her in, this was from an instant message sequence, a direct message from, from Sidra and myself uh, when she elected to talk and get all this out there. Um, you know, so, so this is first hand knowledge from her information as far as uh, we're not making this up, not you know bringing this up out of the blue. The incident uh, closed at 7.51 p.m. OK, so this makes sense now. The incident closed at 7.51 p.m., but a second incident was was created in the system an hour later at 9.07 p.m. This time, Sidra called 911. The dispatcher's name was N. Calkins, quote, 10 Dash 21 to RP um, or, or responding party has more questions about vehicle. 28 called responding uh, reporting party back and left a message. The incident was closed at 9 16 p.m. on October 18th, uh, 2014. Uh, Stephen, can you tell uh, the listeners, you know, what is the responding or when they call this uh, the RP and when they make the close the report and open the report and things like that from a as a former law enforcement, can you give a little background on that's just law enforcement talk uh, is what that basically is, right? Yeah, the, the RP is a reporting party. So that's the person that calls 911 or the dispatchers in that jurisdiction. And officers arrive and then they, they'll evaluate the situation. But, you know, a lot of times they have blinders on, you know, either they're rookies or they're, you know, three months out of their 20 years left in retirement. There's a lot of things that are missed, you know, and I, like I said, I'm working this big elder abuse homicide case that everybody's missed. And, you know, with, with AVP and stuff like that, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to number 57 later on, of course, uh, fast forward to the bullet is, you know, how do you miss a bullet in an eight foot ceiling on a major, major crime scene? I mean, they should have scoured that thing with bristle brushes. So, um, you know, they could find the call and found it or whatever, but that's on the officers. And if something pops up the next morning on day shift and they got two bodies in there, that means those officers uh, that, that responded to that call probably didn't do their job. Thank you, Stephen. Sure. Continu continuing on, because um, this does get interesting as far as uh, complicated, I should say, complicated. 
According it's to- a, I mean, it's a well, maybe the other thing to note too is because I was trying to figure out not only um, when when did Kamel's sister uh, when did when did she drive out there? So she it, it, it's a fifteen hour drive, correct? That's a long drive. Yeah, they left oh. the day before and, and stayed somewhere overnight, and then completed the next morning and left, and then got into the Twin Cities area around uh, noon. Uh, uh, yeah, sometime, in the, sometime in the afternoon, late afternoon, maybe. Okay. Yeah. For, for me, that would be a two day drive. I'm not doing 15 hours in one, in one day, but who knows, you know, they're both young there too. So I was, I was wondering about that. And then, yeah, the, the timing, as you can see, I did get uh, one of the times wrong. Uh, it should have been, what did I say? It should have been seven, seven Oh eight PM. And I put seven Oh eight AM. Yeah. Cause that'd be a long incident that was closed at seven fifty one PM. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> These are some of the reasons why we're, we're doing live proofreading here. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Continuing on, it says, according to Detective Gummert, Sidra, quote, quote, Sidra stated it was decided that she would drive up to Minnesota to try to find out what was going on. She stated, according to her records, she arrived in Minnesota on October 19th, 2014. So this was right out of the reports that Greg pulled. Um, he did state, uh, Detective Gummert, that she arrived on the 19th. We know for a fact it was the 18th that she arrived in October, October 18th. So we've noticed little things like this that are wrong. Uh, and me, maybe he keyed it in wrong. Maybe he typed it in wrong. Maybe Sidra told it to her wrong. But nonetheless, the official report says she got there on the 19th of October. We know that she got there on the 18th of October. So it's little things like this that were never you know, really cleaned, uh, cleaned up. And, and Gummert would have had access to that report to actually verify those days and those He could have times. went and looked it up and, and verified it. So I think a lot of this stuff, he just, a lot of these guys, it just seemed like they winged it when they, when they typed up their reports. They just kind of did it off the cuff. They didn't dot the I's and cross the T's. And I know, you know, Stephen can attest to this. Go ahead, Stephen. <laughs> I was just, just going to say, every single sentence, word, paragraph, phrase, prologue, everything that goes over the radio is long. Yeah. You know, okay. Everything's long. Yeah, so as long. far as the sound, the audio, if they would have pulled that, they would have had everything anyway. But it just goes sure. to show, I think they were just looking at their notes maybe or just looking at their calendar and plopping in dates for these reports. But they have to be right on a case like this. And this also shows that at the time that it wasn't that big of a case. This is, wasn't that important of a deal for this whole uh, operation when this was going on back then. They didn't. This was just they were batting their eyes and, and going on about with their normal business is very low importance is what the perception I get from this. How about you, Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I agree. And it's not just um, the the um, police reports that give different dates. Uh, Sidra gave a different date of when she showed up in the death of a dystopian article. She tells them it's October 16th. She tells Gummert it's October 19th, but yet we have proof in the call log that it was the 18th. So Sidra's story changes constantly and why the police never followed up. And I agree with you, Dan, it had to have been because they considered everything just low priority. Don't worry about it. It'll, it'll work itself out but it didn't. Yeah, I remember, and um, Greg probably remembers this, as, as when I was talking with Sidra about this or communicating uh, with it, I don't think I talked to her live in this situation, was direct message, but I said, I need to see the credit card receipts. I need to see the statement of when you were where. And she sent it. She sent the, the credit card, uh, some screenshots and some PDF files to say, hey, we stopped for gas on the 17th. Uh, it was in... Uh, uh, Nebraska. We stopped and got snacks on the 18th that afternoon in Minnesota. So I knew that she got there on the 18th. They were on their way on the 17th. And then it shows them when they left and stopped um, in Albert Lee to a motel, another city in Minnesota before they left. That was on the 18th and then checked out on the 19th. So we knew for a fact from the credit card purchases, not the transaction, uh, not the posting date on the credit card, but the transaction date that it took place, the credit card charges. So we're able to use that because I, I said back in the time when this was going on, there was a lot of people discrediting Sidra at the time, saying she's lying or she's making it up. And I said, in order for you to be credible, you need to send me those credit card receipts, uh, not the receipts, the paper receipts, but the statement, just showing the list of the dates. Um of when things happen, because I said, we have to give you credibility when I was speaking with her, because no one's, no one's believing anything you're saying. And you are the sister in this case. And she's the one who wanted to come forward and expose this stuff that was just to, just to 
kind of dot the I's and cross the T's. And I said, give me the, the screenshots of your credit card statement that you received. And she sent it. And I said, that's what's going to help us now get over this hump because it is what it is. Anything well, that's else? good to know, you know, because from my, I didn't even know she sent those. And I'll tell you straight up, I don't trust her as far as I can throw her. And I've had this discussion. I believe it was with her, but if she's going to give receipts, so it's like, if she has these, my, my main question, my main issue with, with Sidra this whole time is that, you know, if she has these receipts and she can prove when she was there, because like you said, that gives credibility, then why does the story constantly change? And it's like, stick to it. I left, we left Texas on the 16th. We didn't drive straight up for 15 or 16 hours. We stopped for two days and it took a, why the drama of we, you know, we left and we drove straight through for 16 hours and we get there seven o'clock in the nighttime, go back 16 hours. And that's in the wee hour morning. It just, this is my issue with her. And now, and that's a good point, Catherine, because there are a lot of people, including myself, that doesn't have trust in her as far as the things that she's stated and opinion and her thoughts on things and her beliefs on things. But as long as we got, once we got the financial transactions correct, um, I also think that we're, all of us here on the panel are adults and very detail oriented. She, at the time, was very young. Uh, I don't want to call her flighty, for instance, but she's not going to pay too much concern on the dates. I don't think, I think she just guessed whatever it was. And that's what she said, not knowing that we're going to, going to uh, scour everything with a white glove. You know, if she would go back and say, Oh, I didn't know these guys were that serious about all the details. I would have made sure it was right. I was asking these questions and we'd get, like you said, Catherine, an answer here in this report. One day she talked to someone else on an interview. Another day it was mentioned. She'd do an interview somewhere else. It's another day. So we have all these dates and we as a group spent all of our time reconciling all these right. things that were wrong. We spent all this time and we could have been so much more efficient moving forward if we weren't trying to go back and correct and reconcile everything. And now I think if we were to talk to her now, she'd say, okay, now it makes sense. You guys are really interested in very detective type homicide detective <laughs> details. She thought we were just armchair people speculating and conspiracy theorists that didn't know what we're doing. So she answered, I think, very quick, whatever she thought, just to get us kind of out of her hair. But I could be wrong there too. But at least I said, we need to create credibility as far as the transactions, the financial. I said, you used your credit card, right? Yes. Send us the transaction details so we at least know the dates and the timelines of all those things. Um, but yes, as far as what happened now in the aftermath, yeah, she's someone that that I don't think any of us uh, trusts. It'd be nice to have her back on uh, the show or an interview now as well. She's since married with, with children and maybe her thoughts have changed, but uh, she went way down another whole road we don't need to get into here, but uh, she does believe David did it and David's some... Um, bad guy, which is, uh, which is not the case. Yeah. And, and I think there was a lot of people, um, a lot of the gray state goons, as we call them, they were, they were really hounding her during this, this whole time too. I think once she got burned by those guys and she realized that they were just frauds in at least in, uh, 27, 2017, maybe some of her views have, have changed since that point. I, yeah, I don't know. Correct. I, I um, just, I just, I just, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Greg. I, I just wanted to in, interject with Dan. What he's saying is that, you know, as, as a former police officer, when, a, you know, I mean, one of my first robberies was at a, uh, a restaurant and there was a, there was 80 people sitting there for dinner and everybody described uh, the suspects, the gun. It was, you know, when the barrel, the barrel was, you know, this big. And so under pressure, that's one thing. Also, you're saying she's young. Yeah, she's not going to pay attention to details. She's spending money like a drunken sailor, you know. And so, but when you call her on, when you get the red tape, which includes uh, uh, the calls to AVP, Apple Valley, everything else, you just fit those in there because unless she has some agenda uh, uh, to or fro with, with regarding our, our uh, mission, is, uh, what, what, is there any gain out of it? No, I think she just probably... Uh, you know, wasn't paying attention. But once you once you put everything together and start tying it up, her 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 uh, her, her red tape and everything else may match. But in in a crime scene or anything like that, I mean, the timeline is so important, you know. And that's one of the biggest things. And that leads you into who was there when, the cameras on, not on. You know, it, it brings it down. But timelines are very important. But Dan's Dan's right. 
uh, she, she might have been young and, and wasn't paying attention. And I think you guys have the information you, you need on that. Yeah. And, and to Stephen's uh, point is, you know, we we meticulously had to go back with the details that we got then and then build and construct that timeline. Then we right. all became yeah. comfortable. And, OK, here's what yeah. happened on that on this whole October 18th situation, because that was very confusing. But we had to build that ourselves. You know, it wasn't yeah. the people we asked. We all got goofy answers until we started getting the the proof, I guess. And then we started being we were able to back into the actual official timeline. Yeah, there, there you go. Um, I did have one question since we're kind of on this for Matthew. Um, when, did David ever talk about his wife's family? I know he probably talked about his wife, but did he ever mention anything about his wife's family? I'm assuming he didn't never talked about. No, nothing. nothing no, not no. really. I mean, David was a very personal person. A very, he, he kept his private life personal and a personal and. That's just the way he was. He was very stoic. Very he he only spoke when he needed to. So anytime he we had conversations, you know, it was always what we were working on at that time, or if he shared his personal feelings, you knew. It was just few and far between. Interesting. Thank you. Can I say uh, say something, Matthew? You served with him, and I never met the man. I know he's a great American soldier, and we salute him. Um, but you know, he 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 definitely had. He, I would say just from what I've heard from, from I've watched your other interviews, uh, David had plans. Am I correct? He was a talented guy. He 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 lo he was looking ten steps ahead. So when he got out of the service, he was going to move on to something else. Am I correct? Yes, sir. He was. Um, <clears throat> one of the things he, while we were actually in country in Afghanistan, um, I specifically remember a, a memory when we were working with After Effects and with uh, the Photoshop Creative Suite Six. And he was asking questions on how to use it and you know there you go. <laughs> his uh, his film career and i had already graduated from the art institute of california san francisco so i had experience with this and i was just like this is awesome you know he's in he's into filming he's into special effects and that's how we hit it off as far as yeah. our relationship was so he was very goal oriented you know chess yeah, you know, like, people, people 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 so you graduated from san francisco uh, art institute yes i did in 2006. <laughs> Yeah. People don't realize that that costs as much as Stanford, man. That <laughs> it, it was not cheap, but I, I tell you, it, it definitely uh, opened doorways for me. And in San Francisco, being the way I was raised with you know, right. the center, it was a definite moral compass shift <laughs> in some respects. But uh, you know, it, it just led me to what what David was trying to offer the world, which was the truth. And yeah, and that, you know, and, 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 and yeah, you know, and I'm a third generation San Franciscan myself. <laughs> Certainly. And it's just, you know, he, he was so determined to go to Full Sail University. And, and when he went there and he was going through the process and, you know, he would call me and we would have conversations about, hey, I need help with this. Or, hey, could you give me your opinion on that? Or I, I was always thrilled to get those phone calls because, you know, we hadn't talked in you know, a couple of months or a few years or whatever the case may be. And he would just randomly show up. And I was like, this is rad, you know. And that's yeah, why I no, wanted to tell myself for, for uh, my, my secondary degree and my master's degree is because he went there and I wanted to honor him. And, and yeah, it was well, that's, really, that's so cool. That's it. <laughs> hey, we uh, do have um, our first yeah. question here. If, um, and I was hoping everybody could uh, share what they what they think and why. Um, so this comes from Blue Star Lily. Are there any folks making money off of David's gray state? I'd like everybody to answer that um, and also give any, if you have any thoughts on how you feel about people possibly making money or not making money off of this. Dan, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just go first um, uh, quickly. Is if, if they're referring to then the, uh -huh. the, the script, I think there was plans to make money off it. I don't think anyone right now is making money off of the gray state at all. Not to say that that's not going to happen in the future, but uh, I don't think my opinion is no one's making any uh, money off it currently. Matthew? All right, um, Matthew? Uh, no, I don't think anybody's making any money off it. I do know that they released a whatever fake cut of the original and and no, I, I, that, I don't think anybody's paying for that. So. Uh, <laughs> I, I do believe that Mr. Dan is correct that it, when the truth does come out and it's able to be made correctly, that definitely it can help and prosper. So, yeah. So you, you don't ha you don't have any problem with people making money off of it. 
No, if, um, it, tells, if it tells the truth, if it's the it true tells. script, if it's the true vision of what David wanted, the original, what, what I saw, then yes, I would definitely want that out there because it's pretty much what's going to happen very soon in our country. <laughs> so you're probably not a fan of Eric Nelson's film, A Gray State, it sounds like. No, not at all, because it's not the true vision. It's not what David wanted to portray what's happening in our society. If you notice, without, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if he did it intentionally or if he did it just based on his philosophies. But I mean, if you look at the original Gray State trailer, you can see just little nuances of biblical scripture inserted in there with, you know, not being able to buy, sell, or trade, the martial law, the, the way people are scanned with uh, the chip and everything. It's, it's, it's all there. That's the true vision, the truth. The truth. Um, Catherine? Well, <laughs> I'm going to take a kind of a different approach to this. Are people making and have they made money off of Gray State? I'm going to say yes on the concept. What I mean by that is those who did that sloppy made a pretty penny. And, and it was based off of Gray State. They're, they're skimming money still off of David. David in his journals talked about how people were just like leeches. They were just sucking the life out of him and trying to ride his coattails to, you know, stardom or whatever. And I still see that even today. But at the same time, Gray State itself, um, the what David's concept was, I don't think anybody has has at all. And I kind of want to interject here. I've said this before, and, you know, in my previous job, I, I would love to be able to talk to David, like I wish he was still here and around. Because I would want to know how did he get his, who was his source of information? Because there are some things in that he has in his trailer, concept trailer, that was classified. How did he get that? And why would he put it out? But that's a whole different topic. Awesome. Um, Stephen, any thoughts on people making money off of Gray State then, now, and in the future? Well, you know, you, you, most of you or all of you know, I've been in the television business on and off. It's always been a love of mine from uh, uh, being on the original um, pilot for Dynasty, which was called Oil in 1981, on to Bounty Hunters, 96, 97. I was a talent in 97. I became a field producer. And, and then most recently, because of my book, I got the Hulu thing going. And I can tell you this is even though, uh, you know, I had seven and a half minutes cameo and, and, and they found my book in New York and called me and we, we shot it all in Yosemite. All I got was a stipend. There's no money in the documentary. Having said that is like Dan said, there was a script and everything else. 30, 30, 30 million dollar movie. Yeah, you know, maybe that much. You know, I don't think it would cost that much, but it was David's interpretation. And I'm just saying not, not against Catherine is he knew a lot more than he could say. He also was visionary. So it's like George Orwell, 1984, you know, I mean, look at how long ago that book was written. David, David had a vision. He's an artist. Okay. And his first motive or mission was not to make money on it. It was to, 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 uh, to, to, to announce something, to have an agenda, everything else, which I still think maybe probably cost him his life because if you look back, there was no projects and no big major, there's no major studios, but whether it's MGM, Universal, Samuel Goldwyn, you know, whatever, Tombstone Entertainment, they'll buy the script and stuff, and but they'll pay you what you probably made on it, that it costs you. But it's hard to get somebody to take a project like that in the, politi the politics in the world we live in now. And we go to Philip Payne and Philip Marshall, all that kind of stuff. But David was producing something more than a book. People are visual. You come out with a movie or a documentary or a film that is, you know, like I said, I, I've, I've seen Eric Nelson's thing, and, and Catherine's right. Not a lot of money, but a &E has some of this on there. There's some podcasts. Those representatives or owners of those podcasts, um, yeah, they made a few bucks because they, 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 you know, they're, they're on YouTube or whatever. But um, my my guess is is that that I, I I think Eric Nelson chopped it up. I think he put his own stuff in there. It looks like Transformers meets, you know, Sylvester Stallone in First Blood or something. I mean, no, it's not going to quite, quite be like that, but maybe it was. Um, I don't think that Eric Nelson had the right to uh, to take the, take that intellectual property 
and to groom it and, 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 mold, and mold it into what he thinks it would have been, even though it's not that far off, it's really far off. So I think that they, they, they finish it up. David would have had a, hard, had a hard time selling this and it wouldn't have done a good movie theater. It probably would have come out 20 years later, like the artist that dies and it becomes a cult classic. That, that's my Interesting. opinion. Interesting. All right. Okay. Um, that is a great question. Now, Dan, um, I'll send it back to you if you want to continue on. I'll pull up the screenshot here. Yeah, it says here, according to Detective Gummert, quote, Sidra stated that it was decided that she would drive up to Minnesota to try to find out. Uh, wait, we read that already. Okay, quote, Sidra stated that she had stopped by the Apple Valley Police Department, end quote. Detective Gummert continued, quote, to discuss a possible escort to the residence, however. She was advised that based on her information that she provided to the officer, it was felt the matter was civil and that we could not offer assistance at that time. However, Sidra stated that she was advised by the officer that when she arrived at the residence, if issues did arise, that she could certainly call 911 and we would offer assistance at that point. Now that makes uh, makes total sense. They're just getting into the semantics there as far as what their responsibility is uh, at a civil or a criminal side of things. So they just said, go, go there. We will provide if something comes up, but we're not gonna escort you to the residence just for that. Did, is it is it is it kind of interesting? Do people find it interesting that she doesn't just drive to the Crowley home, that she drives here first to the Apple Valley police station first? Almost as yeah, if she, yeah. she she knows there's gonna be a confrontation or something. Yeah, I mean that, that you know, there's nothing wrong with a asking for a civil standby if you if you feel that it might be an unsafe situation, and that's what law enforcement's job is part of their job, you know. And and, and this shows that. Sidra felt that there was going to be some confrontation right. or something. Yeah, that's right. Exactly, Greg. But in when you read David's journal, you find out why. I mean, there was a huge confrontation between Kamel and her family. They were fighting hardcore. And so, but yet Sidra tries to make it sound like David is going to be the protagonist and the person who's pushing all the issues when in fact, the fighting, the infighting was amongst the alums. Da David was an outsider. So that's where I find interesting that she's going to, I need an escort. Why? Your your family started it with your sister. That was, that's my two cents. I think that's, yeah, I think that's spot on because obviously when, when this book was, was written, we didn't have, I didn't have the, the day one journal. And we're just kind of going against what does the police report say starting there, right? Then we get the day one journal and we're like, well, okay, well, wait a minute. Something isn't matching up here. That's what it seemed like to me. Top of page 169 begins, when Sidra arrived at the Crowley residence, David opened the front door to speak with her. She described David as skinny with disheveled hair, adding he, quote, looked crazy. Um, now that I think it's just an opinion that's that's pushing a narrative there that we don't need. But she obviously went out of the way to add that. Um, going on, it says, quote, David would not let her in to see her sister, end quote. Date Detective Gummert reported. Continuing, he told her to go. To go to her car and he would come out to go out to the car and he would come out to speak with her in the driveway end quote when david came outside he told sidra they did not want contact with her or the alum family according to detective gummert david start stated that he along with kamel felt that they were treating kamel's mother inappropriately remember now she had the cancer and there was some some type of shady dealings going on with the situation down in texas sidra told david that they were welcome to call the hospital and speak with their mother and hospital staff to find out uh, if they were not doing, if they were uh, not doing anything inappropriate, end quote. Continuing, Sidra was told to come back in an hour to get the Acura. David added that she would need to take the Toyota as well. One hour later, Sidra came back to the Crowley residence to find the Acura parked on the street. Sidra parked the Toyota in the driveway. Any thoughts on that now, as far as the timing and the inappropriate, uh, this was the, the, the cancer that she had and, and going along with getting uh, chemo and stuff that brought the family to not agree on the treatment. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah. Greg? Yeah. 
Uh, Catherine, you're muted. Catherine. <laughs> oh, yes. Probably better that way. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> According to the, the journal, that was definitely one of the issues, but there was a lot more other stuff going on that they were, they were infighting with a lot of internal, in-depth, ongoing things for a very, very long time. But I think that when Nyla got sick, that was probably what brought everything to the head. And with Kamel being the the nutritionist and the naturalist, she wanted her mom to take a natural route because the chemo was just so bad. And so they just, I just think that that was just the straw. I don't think that was necessarily the cause. It was just the straw that broke the camel's back. And the reason for the car exchange ultimately was that the car was given to David and then they refused to pay the auto insurance on it. Mr. Alam says, if that's the case, then uh, if it's going to be uh, repossessed or not going to have insurance on it, you're going to be driving it without insurance. Then I want it back. Uh, you can have another car if you want, but I want that one back. That's what precipitated this whole thing. And so there was multiple things, like Catherine says, that all led to this whole, I don't want to call it a perfect storm, but the cancer thing really started exposing everything here. Right. And the one thing that I think we're all kind of missing, and I missed it for a long time, it wasn't until Sophia brought it to my attention, you know, because I, you know, I lived in Texas for a couple of years. So I know how law enforcement is, especially with out of state plates. The black Toyota Corolla had expired plates. They expired July of 2014. There's no way, no way that she could have driven that car from Texas all the way to Minnesota and never got stopped, especially in Texas. So I my see. question is, did they tow it? And not that that's either, neither here nor there, but I'm, I will challenge her. I, I would want proof that she drove that vehicle without getting stopped. I see. Or, or proof that, that she did get stopped some type of a ticket or something. I, I don't know. In, in, in California, you know how they are. It's very oh, lax. Texas is not that. No, Texas yeah. is because when we were there, uh, we had California plates when we got to Texas. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they told us that we got pulled over because it was over 30 days. And we had to prove that my husband at the time was military. And we're like, well, we're in the military. They're like, we don't care. Get your plates changed. So they don't mess around. Texas doesn't mess. Right. Do, they, yeah. do they give you time to, to change that before there's any? Well, because we were military, we, we were allowed. But this is a civilian car with expired and not even a little expired. We're talking expired plates months. They would, that would have been pulled over for sure. And it was in Kamel's name, not David's name. I think so. Yeah. Okay. And how well, many states would they have to have gone through? You go to Texas. Can uh, you, Oklahoma, we could pull up the map, Colorado. but I'm sure it's like yeah. six, probably. Yeah. With, so uh, they could have been stopped Nebraska. in the, in multiple states right at, at some point so, correct uh, correct yeah that'd be interesting to follow up on to see if they were stopped multiple times actually yeah yeah i know i know in my search of of people and i don't want to say what i did and and what i used but i never found a, a ticket on that vehicle so. now the you know from minnesota that interstate 35 leads directly into texas there only is one oh, okay they never have to get off they're never taking other other roads they're on the interstate and going straight shot and so they would probably be able to make it pretty quick, but I think there's five or six states in between. If, I think if you if you look it up, my question is, what do they talk about when they mean was there shady dealings going on? Uh, what what, what did that re relate to? I don't get that. Hmm. Anyone? Who was talking about shady dealings? I got lost. Um, I just read it as far as she said. Sidna says, you know, you can call the hospital and talk to my parents uh, if there's something that you don't think is appropriate. Now, I know they had the the friction with the treatment. But they, she said that David and Mel thought there were some shady dealings going on down in Texas about her care. And I just wanted to see if anyone here on this panel could expand on that. I'm not because I don't know myself what that meant. Well, it might, it might be some, some, someone's trying to get a conservatorship. Did the family have money? Uh, you got to look at that first. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or they power do. Of or, so power look, of at, look, look at somebody. Look at somebody who's going to gain being a conservator. And you know, going in or avoiding probate, whatever. But that's an, 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 you know, cancer, whatever. I don't know her age, sixty-five or older is elder abuse in, in California. But look at the motive on that. Gotcha. So white collar, some kind of a criminal thing uh, on paper. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's pretty interesting. 
So it says the uh, upon getting into the Acura, wrote Gummert, she observed a picture on the driver's side of the car. The picture was of her, her mom, and her sister. So this is Sidra, Nyla, and Kamel, a photo. On the back portion of the picture was a note stating, I will always love you and mom. And she signed the picture, Kamel. Sidra stated she felt something was wrong with what was going on, but drove back to Texas to advise her family of her findings. So any thoughts on the photos there, guys? And what, you know, I've always loved you, kind of similar to the text message left on the laptop. David allegedly wrote, I've always loved you. Now Kamel writes it. Uh, it's a photo of those three. I've always loved you. Um, what's thoughts on that, Catherine? Um, I'm, oh, I'm so glad you brought this up because um, I think it was either in the death of a dystopian or in another uh, conversation Citra had with somebody else. She then goes on to state that um, she then writes on the back of this photo, I love you too, and then left the photo with David and Kamel. Now, this photo is nowhere around. You would think that if this photo was such a key piece of evidence, she would have either A, kept it, or somebody would have it and show proof that this exchange took place. But it's nowhere. It it's, was never mentioned again. Correct. And that's correct, Catherine, because uh, from an outsider looking in, we don't know if any of this has any truth to it. Was there a photo? Was there correct. a note? Was there a photo at all? Did any of this even... Yeah. Be, was any of this true? And so this is where it creeps in this whole Sidra doubt that uh, did she make it up? Because it certainly lends to the narrative that David was, you know, controlling and, you know, she, she wasn't able to get out of the house and he wouldn't let her out, but she couldn't do anything and just wanted to say that, hey, I love you. You know, this, this lends to more propaganda in what it feels like in my mind that's being inserted into the case. But you're right, with a case this big, how come this photo has never shown up? Yeah, and and if she was so concerned, and this is where I, I really see the dichotomy between um, Sidra and her narrative versus what David writes in his journal. Sidra is making it out that David was controlling, Kamel wanted out of the marriage, she wasn't happy, it was a terrible situation. And then you read David's own words and he's like, God, this woman is so mentally strong. She's so smart. She, I can't get her to do anything. She's not listening to me. I'm telling her, stop fighting with your family. And she's basically telling me to shut up and go somewhere. I mean, clearly he wasn't controlling her. You know, by his own words, he's, he tells you that he was struggling just to have a foot and a say in the situation. And yet Sidra, it brings up this, unwarranted drama and then with nothing to back it up yeah good good point very interesting now at the bottom of page 169 continuing on the last paragraph it says all communication between the alam family and david or kamel stopped after sidra's trip to minnesota according to detective gummert's report so basically she got back Sidra says she's going to report all her findings, and uh, evidently she did. But nothing was reported on that we hear of. All communication was was cut off. Now, Kamel's father stopped paying the bill for David and Kamel's phone service. Top of page 170. Quote, it was decided at that point, wrote Detective Gummert, that the phone service for both of them would be cut off. They stated that they cut David's off completely, and they limited Kamel's phone service at that point thoughts on that because we know at this point that the because the insurance wasn't paid and the tabs weren't renewed they wanted the cars back now they're also paying the phone bill saying if you guys don't want to play ball uh two can play at that we're going to cut off your service and so no this answers all the questions as far as why did david change his phone was he leaving the family you know was he isolating himself no they cut off the phone he was forced now to go get another phone another service create a new service account, get a new phone number, and do all that in the middle of all this other circumstances. So, yes, there was a perfect storm going on there with all of those things. Now, Kamel was still their daughter, so they said, look, we'll keep the plan on for you. We'll minimize it to whatever it was back uh, back then in 2014. Maybe it was a number of hours or a data plan of uh, not to exceed five gigabytes. I don't know what the plan was back then, but they, they dropped her down to something as far as a bare minimum, I think. And they cut David off the contract altogether, which in my mind, uh, if I'm Mr. Alam, that's all, that's all fair. All this is fair so far. 
They may not like it, but so far it's all fair. It doesn't have to result in crime, but, you know, Mr. Lom was not the bad guy here. Uh, Most of us would do the same thing in response to these types of things, but that's just what the family was going through. It's just a young couple, um, but they weren't doing it because of, we also get the other side of the story, Greg, what we've heard ourselves is they couldn't, the Crowleys were so broke. Alams had to pay for the phone bill. The Crowleys mm. are so broke, they had to buy the car. The Alams had to buy the car, pay the insurance, uh, get the tabs. He couldn't buy the tabs. He couldn't renew the car's tabs because they were so broke. So we're hearing this from the goons that they were financially unstable, which is not true. We know that Mr. Alam offered these things as a as a gift um, and to help out his new son-in-law, to help out his daughter. Um they didn't need it, but we see how the others on the other side of the fence are pushing and, and focusing on these things to claim that this is why all this happened. They didn't have money. They were in debt. David killed everybody because he couldn't uh, couldn't, you know, he couldn't get through it. That is a blatant lie. That's not true. Um, they were not having financial difficulties, but he was making bad, uh, unwise choices, one could say, I guess. Um, and Mr. Alams just said, well, I'm not going to pay you anymore. You can get your own form bill. Oh, that, isn't that, that isn't isn't that kind of kind of cool though? At some point, if it's true that David's dad or that Kamel's dad bought 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 a car for David, that's pretty cool. David's own dad didn't even do that for him. And well, then paying, this, paying, that leads back into we hear all the stories of the Alams hated him. Uh, David hated <laughs> the Alams because they were right. Pakistani. Yeah, you know, he didn't right. like uh, the foreigners. He didn't like this uh, Islamics. Uh, you know, we we know all these things are false, but this show this goes to show once again for proof how uh, much the alums loved David, how much they got along with David and Kamel, how much they appreciated them and how much they all got along. Um, you know, so they, they were all very getting along very good. Yeah. yeah then, up yeah. until that yeah. certain point, And then it became a tit for tat and you know, well, you're not going to pay the insurance. I don't see uh, again, that's hearsay. I see no proof that David didn't keep up with the insurance. Well then, you know, they were fi- in fighting with Kamel and her family. And then all of a sudden now we have issues with the insurance. Well, since we did that now let's take the phone away because now they say they don't want to talk to us. And, and I'm not, because I think everybody at one point or another has that little bickering going back and forth with families. And that's what I see the situation. And then, you know, David talks about in his journal where he was, you know, he's like, thank goodness I'm doing these jobs on the side, making 75 an hour because now I I can keep the bills paid until gray state. Like you were saying, Dan, you know, everybody wants the narrative to be that they were flat broke, but clearly they were not. The other thing to, to point out is, and when I spoke to Mr. Alam myself on the phone, is he even reiterated that with some of the disagreements we had, he said, um, he still liked and loved David. He says, yeah, we, we got into some things off to the side, but Mr. Alam was very clear to point out that I still love him as a person. I still loved him as a son-in-law. Do we get along all the time? No. We had some disagreements. No, but he never cut the line and says, okay, I'm done. Uh, well, you're, you're an idiot. Uh, we're done with you guys. He's, he made it sound like a, a very mature adult to say just some things we agree with, some decisions that were made. There's some retaliatory decisions that I made, but I still love the guy. That I have nothing against him as a person. I just don't agree with some of the choices. So I think it was very mature on the standpoint of Mr. Alam not to blur the lines between the love for his family and his son-in-law, but also setting a line in the sand by saying, you know, there's things that you can't cross here in our relationship. So I'll put a stop to that. And I think David understood that too. He was mad, it wasn't mad and retaliatory. They all understood as adults, functioning mature adults of what was going on. Did they have some things they didn't agree with? Sure. But it didn't impact their uh, you know, relationship as far as that. Now, when they got back, they didn't communicate. So there may, may have been something there said that say, you know what, let's let this cool off a while. We're not going to do anything, but um, I never got the impression from Mr. Alam that they ever even got into a fight. He just said we had some disagreements, but I never, I never even raised my voice to the man is what he told me. So, but Sidra's making it sound like there's all this back, backbiting and, and blood. Uh, you know, it's just nasty stuff going back and forth. Which I think, as a female, uh, maybe to have maybe pers- persuade, uh, t- filtered it in. It perceived to her maybe that, that it was, and she was young and not mature 
Uh, I think that Mr. Olam was handling things very good. She was very immature and young, and she may have thought that, hey, the world was ending because we, we weren't getting along with the in-laws. And then she, to you know, find out later that you know she's probably going through that now herself, that everyone goes through that. You're going to have those. I'll make this comment because I'm the female, and I want you guys to get you know jumped on by other yes. women but sometimes <laughs> women are catty and they will just say stuff that's not true because it makes them feel better and this they blow it completely and out of com proportion thinking that it's going to give them more attention yeah. and that's what i see sidra in this particular situation i can I agree with, i can agree with that well as far as the actual podcast i know dan has to has to jump off here i think that's a great place to stop this podcast um if everybody wants to continue on talking for another 20 30 minutes i would i would love to um to have everybody else can on I, can i stand something real sure. quick before you have to go yeah, um, yeah. where where can you direct me to find the um the bank statements that show that sidra did leave and she was traveling I'm going to pull those up myself because i don't know uh, greg are they in the files section of the justice uh page I don't think so. Uh, I and think probably that, because of privacy reasons. So maybe uh, a point for Catherine and, and the rest of us here is uh, when I was getting data in and data was coming to me, I was kind of preparing the files I felt important, putting them into PDF format and uploading those. But I wasn't uploading every single piece of, of note that I ever received. So if I uploaded 70% of the, the data that I got, uh, stuff like this may have been that other 30%. But I certainly have it. Okay. I'll, I'll find it, send it to you. Uh, I'll send it to you, Catherine. And if that's the case, if it's not out there, I will also take the the extra step of uploading it then because it's very important. And what she did when she sent it to me too was she blacked out and she used a Sharpie. Oh. There's no personal name, address, okay. account number. Okay. It's not on there. And I said, that's fine. We're not getting to that. And I think the part that, that I like that I think uh, Matthew will like is when I was asking her these questions, I think she got also from me that I wasn't trying to steer some story. She knew that I was just looking for black and black and white. What's the answer? What date were you here? I don't care. I'm not trying to sell some narrative. And so I think she got that from me that, hey, these conspiracy theorist folks are asking me all these questions. They must be in it for some reason of their own. And by having the conversation back and forth with me and her left left her that she knew that I wasn't in for anything. I said, I just want the facts. I don't care what anyone thinks or what actually happened or not. I just want to know what happened. And so she got that from from me, I think the sense for me that I'm not trying to, we're not trying to push some fairy tale. We're not trying to push it, a narrative here. So I said, I just want the statement. That's it. I'm not going to do anything with it. You can hide your name. I'm not trying to do anything with it. Cross it off. We'll publish it. So I'll get that off to you, uh, Catherine, and I'll post it. But feel free to stay on the, the rest of the show, guys. This is an important topic. It's very interesting all what happened here in October uh, of 2014 because, you know, two months later is when everything goes down. And for, for what I view was completely different reasons in December is this whole escapade in October that took place that was very impactful, but nothing that would relate or end up or result in a triple homicide. I don't think, I think there was some financial uh, family disagreements and things, finan uh, family, not financial, but nothing that was going on at the other time at the same time that was going on with Danny August Mason and some of these goons that were going on, that planning was in the works of a triple homicide already 60 days before the bodies before the you know christmas and that was in this very same time so th that's what's going on they're fighting this cancer issue and this we don't like the chemo and these little small things that are so minute in the big picture now which were so big to their family back then but david has to realize that his own brother was planning a triple homicide while all this was going on on the other side of the family that was in my opinion. I'm going to clarify that as my own opinion, but the $50,000 withdrawal was done on the same day. Right? It wasn't the 18th at a bank in Minneapolis. It was with $50,000 cash withdrawal was the 18th of October. From an account that wasn't his. From a, from a trust fund that his dad owned who was in Germany. So that's why this is so important because they're, they're fighting and clawing and scratching and these little cat fights over here that were big momentous things which were very small in scope on the other side of the family, his own family was, I believe, planning the demise already at that time to kill these people off so the script could land in their lap. Do you see how, how huge that is? Uh, Dan, Dan, you're so right, right? You know, in all these cases I work that are end up being homicides or elder abuse, 
it starts financially. Okay, it's always the the the, the caregiver related to the uh, victim who's 80, 88 year old dementia patient lives there. Money money's missing. Money's missing. And in the dementia patients, sometimes they 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 the light bulb the light bulb goes on. They, they get into an argument, whatever. And now we have a, a a deceased 80 year old. Money is the motivator. What's the motivator? And these guys like Danny August Mason. Or uh, even don't the, now anybody's trying to make money off of this doesn't realize that there's not that kind of money in this. Th this isn't gone with the wind, man. You know, and so they don't understand the business of uh, Hollywood, LA, whatever. So chances of them making money on David's project are probably rare to none. But they don't know that because they're naive to that system. But and that's why I think it's very important to have a, a true documentary made on this case to show the timelines of all these things yeah. going on in the background with the date at the bottom, as you see it, and the location, Minneapolis, Minnesota, you know, withdrawing funds. Uh, yeah, that, that, well, Waco, that, that, Texas, we're arguing that, about uh, hospice care. Uh, but this that, is that's what the saying. same days. No, that's all what right, I'm guys. saying. The case, the case, Dan, I'll leave it I was going to say it's the case I'm working now. There was $1.7 million that the granddaughter signed on when the guy had dementia that traded $1.7 million into an aggressive uh, trade account, and she signed on it. It's money, Dan. You're right. Yeah, it is. All right. Have a good have a good week, guys. Have All right, buddy. Happy anniversary, anniversary Dan. Yeah. And if I may, I just toss this in there for uh, – the whole fifty thousand dollars and the option, the, the different accounts and everything. You know, it it comes to something that I use on my TikTok a lot, which is called code, which is K or is a C K O W D E, which is controlled knowledgeable opposition who does evil. So you have to think that these people had it premeditated way before the fact because they knew that not only was David going to showcase the truth of what's going on in the world right now, but he was gonna make a lot of money doing it. And, and it was going to be, I mean, if you look at some of the interviews that he had with the different film studios that he was talking to, I mean, National Geographic was interested in made many different motion picture theater companies were interested in it because it was something that people weren't doing. They weren't showcasing what was really happening in the world. Look at the movies that were out at that time. You had some of the Avengers movies coming out and some of these, you know, far-fetched sci-fi type, you know, fantasies, but no real uh, concrete evidence of what's going on in the world. And that's what David was doing. So this was all. No, no, no you're right. You're right. He was. I, I, I know from the business that, I mean, it's tough to make a lot of money on any project. But those other guys, had, had, they, they had green eyes. They were a little naive to this. And David probably would have done well if it would have got launched and got greenlit uh, independently or whatever. Like I said, no major studio will take this because it's Democrats. But right. I'm saying that is that there's still a motive, whether they're naive or not. And the $50,000 uh, taken from a trust, that, that, that's, that, that's the oldest profession in the world, you know? Yeah. It, it, it just, I mean, and anybody who's law enforcement, or anybody who has military experience knows that it, you follow the money. You That's always right. follow Always, always, always. Yeah. And, and it, it'll lead you right to the source. And it could be as simple as someone's bank account, or if they're smart enough, they'll, they'll do it other ways. But uh, like, yeah, someone, exactly. Yeah, they, they, you know, you look at the closest, who is the closest to uh, David? This, Danny August Mason and that other cat, or whatever, oh, the people around him and stuff like that. And then there's also a trust fund thing. So there's a lot of players in that. Um, but my, my, since we're still on here, I told Greg this the other day, I still think that since this crime scene is so sloppy, the dog didn't chew off the hands. We all know that kind of stuff. And uh, that uh, it, it was it was a black ops, shadow ops deal because he's the only guy coming out at that time with something that might um, ruffle a lot of feathers. Absolutely. And That's I'm not kidding when I say that some of the things he's talking about at that time were classified. Yes. And yes. I, in my job that I had, and again, I don't know lots of great big secrets, but I knew some and they, you know, little things and there was stuff and I'm not going to say what he was talking about, but when you see that and you know, it's classified, I want to know how did he know that? And how did he get that in his script? I, I might have an answer to that. Yeah, Matthew knows. <laughs> I might have an answer to that because it's, it's very interesting as you guys are mentioning this, where he got the information. Because a few years ago, 
during this process, after he was murdered and after the, the, the fallout and everything, I got some very strange messages from people on TikTok talking about them being perceived by the FBI, them saying that David had access to information about some very interesting things that are talked about in the world right now. And I'm going to go through my old messages. I'm going to retrieve all those and I'll send them to you guys and get those out there because this person was terrified about the information that they knew and the information David had allocated over his research for the project would drastically change people's perceptions of what really happened. Uh, uh, you're exactly right. You, you got it in a nutshell. It's just like that 21-year-old well, National Guard, whatever he was, that, that, that last leak we had, you know, uh, that just shows that, I mean, you know, you know, you could be an E4 at 21 if you're in the right situation, whatever it is. But is that uh, there's a pe lot of people that shouldn't have classified information. David, you know, I mean, Matthew, you're in the military. There's things you can't talk about. And uh, whether you had classified information or, 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 or that kind of clearance, you know, it's just yeah. part of the code. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I, I had a, the, the highest clearance that I had was a secret clearance. And oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's nothing to joke around about. I had I had officers in the military get in trouble with their computers, with CIA yeah. and all kinds of things by by doing just like mistaking the government computer for their personal computer, and then they would get their computer seized and searched. I've seen that happen many times in the military. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ask Hillary Clinton. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> we can ask her, but. Yeah, uh, for asking. No, but, yeah, right. <laughs> what, I, what I want to go to, hey, Greg's back up. Yeah, that, sorry. Uh, uh, go I, ahead, Stephen. I think to keep our audience going on this, because I know we're, you know, it'll, it was a, probably a little bit light for them, but is you know, I, I think we need to still talk about motive and who were the players at the crime scene. Uh, Catherine with her friend, who's uh, a uh, like a pathologist with uh, post modem lividity and all that kind of stuff. Mm. There's a lot of questions there, but Absolutely. one of the big one of the big things with Greg and stuff was you know AVP not testing the dog feces things like that. You know you know you know there could be the dog could have licked some blood and stuff. We know it didn't eat the hands off everything else. But the the thing I still with Greg the other day on the phone we were speaking is the uh, was it number fifty seven was the bullet in the ceiling Greg we yes. talked about. You know what? I, that 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 you know, it, it, Matthew. You know as well as I do, man. One shot, one kill. And yeah. David, David was an expert. There's no way he put a, a bullet in the ceiling that didn't have any DNA. I mean, he he wouldn't have missed. I mean, why why why, why what's that doing up there? That that's that's my biggest takeaway on this thing. Big thing. And then uh, along that topic too is is that when I was sitting at my computer and I actually saw the headline hmm. that the murder had taken place my first reaction was this can't be real. Like this is not something David would ever do. And I started scouring every report I could find. And the first thing that's, that just blew up in my mind as, as former military was that the back door was unsecure. That was, yeah. the first thing. and I was just like, no, no way. There is no way in, in, in all of my years knowing David or anybody else that's been in the military or former police officer that they don't secure their doors or their oh, windows. Man. You, you, know what, you know, even, even as a former police officer, and I didn't serve or anything, but is that even now I'm sitting here in the middle of the day on a Saturday and my doors are locked. Why make right. it easy for somebody? And it wasn't because Dave was paranoid. That's just how, that's just being smart. That's being that's alert, something. you know? <laughs> I mean, so that's exactly right. And plus, if you're leaving, the other thing too, uh, Matthew, is that when they do these kind of things, they kill the dog yep. because the dog, the dog is going to bark, alert, do whatever. So this, this this hit was done by amateurs that were guided by a black or shadow ops team. That's yes, my they, that's, that's they, my narrative, or Matthew. That's my narrative. No, I I agree, I agree in, in in the respects that it was definitely done by somebody who didn't know what they were doing exactly, and they were being controlled. I mean, right. it, it's 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 just clear as day. You can see that yeah. these people performed the actions and made it look like it was some, you know, death, you know, suicide, murder, suicide, when in, when in reality, it was all, it was all set up. I mean, every exactly. fact and red flag points to it, the bullet in the ceiling, the, the, the back door being unsecured, the way David's body had fallen to the ground or been oh. to fall on the ground. I in mean, the way, the, you know, the weapon on the other side, 
Also, also what Greg brought up, which I, I, I didn't realize until we spoke a week or two ago, was that when the neighbor called, dialed 911, she called it in as a suicide homicide. Now, I've, I've had, a, you know, maybe 20 homicides in my life and been on scenes. If I look at three dead bodies, I'm thinking homicide. I'm not saying, oh, wait, that's a, that's a suicide homicide. No, yes. and that, that, this, this lady's an amateur. So she looks through the window, dials 911 and says, you got a suicide homicide. She, yeah, she, yeah. she, she was coached. Yeah. Yeah. Your average citizen doesn't speak like that. They don't use that type of language. Nobody without... does. She was she was she was immediately coached with with some you know with, with some men in black that knocked on her door and said, "Hey, you know what? Whatever. You know they needed somebody to call this in because it, long the long maybe the longer the crime scene goes and the more lividity and everything else, and maybe it, it, they they don't pick up on what their agenda what their agenda could be. But uh, that neighbor saying it's a suicide homicide. That that tells me that's, that's that's a big that's a big red flag in a, in a, in a very office. specific information. I mean, look at the language. It's not like you know, if somebody calls, they're going to say, I, "I think there's there's gunshots and someone's getting hurt over here." They're going to be yeah. they're not going to be very specific to the saying, "I think it's a murder suicide." Like, <laughs> get that. <laughs> <kind of logic. laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I never heard that. I, mean, I was 10 years in EMT working in an ER when calls coming in. So for 10 years of getting this stuff, never once heard somebody say that in a call. Yeah. I, I remember distinctly in Afghanistan, we had an E7 who, um, who tried to commit suicide on the tarmac when we were going back to Fob Ramrod after I got back from uh, mid-tour leave. And he... He, he somehow, I mean, it's not hard, but he, he somehow got around in, in, his, in his chamber and he set it off and he hit himself in the, the shoulder. And I mean, there was hundreds of people on the tarmac, all right, waiting for us to go back to Fob Ramrod. And I mean, CID pulled at least 50 people in that vicinity and got us down to about seven or eight eyewitnesses who saw what happened. I was one of them. And we're, we're all put in a room separated from everybody else. And CID conducted their investigation and found out what was going on. I mean, that was like, bah, 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 bah. like it was just a well-oiled machine. This yeah, yeah. It was, it was an accidental, sh accidental shooting. It happens all the time. When you play with firearms for a living, you know, people do get shot, you know? Yeah. Oh, he was trying, he was definitely trying to hurt himself. Yeah, he even stated it. And, and it just goes to show you the vast difference between what happened right there within a matter of minutes in comparison to this case, which has been just every, a lot of it's falsified. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I do want to um, actually formally introduce Eric Spitfire Wilkinson. Thank you for joining oh, us hey, here. Hey, buddy. Nice yeah, to meet you. Yeah. You're muted. If, yeah. You are, you are muted, which is. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome. Thank Appreciate you for it, being uh, here. If, if you have any questions, want to please feel free to just join this this talk here that we're just just this having. Is, uh, this has been one of the I've been involved in uh, broadcast with Greg and Catherine for almost damn near a decade now on this yeah. topic. But this is this is, uh, Stephen. Um, you you were spot on saying this is a black op black ops operation, without a doubt. It sure uh, just looking at my. Uh, my notes here, Catherine. You said women are catty, and a lot of the men out here are catty too. At <laughs> that situation, though, Dan was trying to be so delicate, and I'm like, I'll just say it. <laughs> you can see it in his eyes too. I noticed. <laughs> There's there are there any state differences here? Because I know Eric, you're in a different state. We're all in different states. Almost. Um, uh, Matthew and Stephen, real quick, just your backgrounds, real quick. Sure, go ahead, Mister Stephen. Oh, I, I, I'm a former police officer, San, San Jose Police Academy, a 1981 graduate, and then went on to Burlingame uh, Police Department in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then uh, Foster City, and I worked dope, and I worked Detective Bureau, and then uh, had a Gold's Gym, and after that, I got into the uh, uh, country club business, onto the uh, bail bond business for 12 years, and became a bounty hunter, and, and still to this day, still some, do some PI work. Cool, cool. I'm myself. I'm a ranger, uh, a park ranger, and currently we have a somebody working there who's just retired from the police force, and he did narcotics. And wow, talk about an exciting life! Uh, a scary, <laughs> exciting life, but nonetheless, yeah. cleaning up the streets. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, and yourself, Matthew? Uh, yes, sir. I'm a, I'm a retired Army Infantry Sergeant, 11 Charlie Mortarman, uh, High Angle Hell, as they used to say, and. Uh, 
now graduated from the University of California at San Francisco in 2006, master's degree from Full Sail in uh, 2014, uh, in August. And now I'm just speaking Yahweh's truth to anybody who will listen about our Messiah. And Where have you guys been? <laughs> Where have these guys been, <laughs> Greg Sophia? You guys you know, it's, it's, like, I, Go ahead, sir. Every time, every show that ha happens uh, that Greg puts on, I learn something new. And I, once again, I'm learning new things from both of you. Not only that am I learning things from both of you, but you have, you're bringing uh, credible facts and credible data from credible sources. Well, I appreciate that. So, you know, it's, it's anybody can claim to be an expert. Anybody can. And if you put somebody in a lab coat, people believe them more. For, for some reason, we believe in Bill Nye for the last several decades. I you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but it's like, the, the truth is this. Justice is going to come because no darkness can escape the light. The longer you, and Jordan Peterson said this best, the longer you stare into the abyss, the, the abyss will stare back. But the light will always come through. Yeah. So nothing in this will ever be hidden forever the truth will come out and the more and more we probe at it the more and more we use facts deductive reasoning and logic we're going to find justice for david and his family and that's what we need to pursue amen i couldn't have said it better amen <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I'm, oh, go ahead now please you, so you, I'm. The, you're going to have to tell me to shut up, and I will never <laughs> say, never. say shut up. Stop talking. Never, but never. Um, I want to kind of go back to um, you know the the motive and uh, the letter that Danny August Mason wrote to David. The audacity and the nerve of this man, who's putting in this letter, he's demanding ten percent of the gross profit or gross not profit but gross monies made off grace that's gross it's very gross it is i'm like yeah. David, I, 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 get that. the people funding it won't get 10 percent, and he's demanding 10 percent before he signs anything talk right. about greed and uh, it all like stephen was saying follow the money and you have D uh dan jr who goes and takes out the 50 grand loan you have danny august mason demanding 10 percent of whatever's going to be made any monies made and it's like dude your ego is so huge it, it's right. phenomenal and so you we have so many paths well two two or three paths to follow and that money when you're following the money path it leads to those closest to him his yes. family and his friends well friends i came across something yesterday on tiktok from a preacher that really struck me it says you can have family that's your blood, but that doesn't mean you share the same spirit. Hmm. And, and that's true in my life. And that was true in David's as well. It's just like, you know, people can be, you, know, you can have a brother or sister, a mother or father, but that doesn't mean that they love you the way you love them. Well, someone, as someone who's adopted, I can resonate with that. You know, there's things that people make absolutes and nothing's absolute in this world. No. Except the energy that encompasses our body from in one great get way. <laughs> Amen. This is this is what we need to be doing. It is is not be afraid to speak about what true justice looks like, and and that's not picking up the sword. That's not picking up the rifle. It's using our words when when we're needed to actually fight the enemy physically will be told but this is what we need to do with what we're experiencing now is tell people the truth and the truth is is that david and his situation needs to be shown the light that it is it's been shrouded in darkness you know black ops aside and everything else the truth that he was trying to convey to to everybody was that the world is in turmoil and we need to find a way out of it and the only way out of it is to unify and it's to set you free. Right? Ego what was is that, free. Eric? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Oh, he's talking about showing the truth, and the truth will set you free. My, my truth actually put me in a prison because, and thanks, Greg, for having me on again because yeah. 
I'm banned from YouTube. I'm not even. Are allowed. you really? <laughs> for, for the for the seventh time now here. No, no, I'm completely banned. If if, if there's any way that I can get a show going, it would be to use somebody else's number, somebody else's <laughs> email. So I've been essentially banned, like many others who have told the truth, like David Ike, like Vinny Eastwood, who's currently facing a lengthy prison sentence just for protesting in New Zealand. Uh, but digressing again, uh, like many of these people who have been silenced, um, and Greg, Greg is is as this great passion uh, for David Crowley as I do too. As it seems like you two do. Where have you been? And keep doing what you're doing because this needs to be. This movie would have blown the. This movie came out way before the elites wanted us to see this. That was the problem. And he was an independent movie maker about to show us things they they. I think we can probably all agree. It seems like uh, you're very awake, Matthew, obviously. And I know Greg and Catherine are too. They, they show us things before they do it, but they weren't ready for David to show this yet. No. And, and so he had to be silent because they were talking about the surveillance state. They were, he was even talking about geoengineering and he was most definitely talking about a bioweapon. Greg gave me uh, both endings. I think three different endings of the book. And they were talking about a bioweapon that would cripple the world. What did we just go through? I mean, Greg was Greg was spot on in following this because he saw that David Crowley was a visionary, a visionary, quite pro quite possibly a prophet. But, you know, that might be taking it to a, a different level. But this movie did not get made because of why? Why? Because none of us believe the official narrative. It stinks. There's there's 10,000 reasons why it didn't happen the way Apple Valley Police presented it and only a couple why it did and i'm just glad to see people are still keeping this fire alive because david crowley is a hero to myself yeah. well and like matthew was saying earlier david himself with his own words is vindicating him against the narrative because when you're reading his words and you compare what he's saying and how he felt about not only his family but about the world as it was it it is in complete opposition to what the narrative is stating. He wasn't a man that was bitter and angry and was snapping and was controlling. He was a man who had a heart where he said he cried for hours and he couldn't stop because, you know, and he couldn't control it, but he's crying because he saw where humanity was going. It, it, he was a totally different person. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's, that's exactly why the narrative fails. It's David's own words. So because we have uh, Matthew and Stephen, who I've never met in the panel, I, I would like your take on MK Ultra and, uh, you know, the type of direct energy weapons they have. Um, I've looked at a, a lot of these people are just nuts that believe this is happening to them. And that kind of sucks. That, that kind of takes away from it. But these weapons, there's hundreds of patents for it. They do exist. And. That was one of the things I've always br brought up when we were talking about this is that the only reason that this man did this is because of, of something to that nature. What do you guys think? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Saying that David was under MK Ultra and that's why he did this? Wow. Possibly. No, it's it's one of the many possible reasons why this could have, it could have just been a straight up assassination. I yeah. guess I'm just, I'm putting out there that these weapons do exist and what better person to use it on than him? Right. Um, it, well, for, no, Damon was not under any of my control, that's for sure. But as far as the, the idea of it, I can give you some history of what I've learned over the years. Is that yes, please. You guys, remember, you guys remember the original Tetris game that was made in 1984, 86 for Nintendo? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. If you look into the actual history behind that game, it was actually designed for mind control because it is used with the different frequencies of the music and the movement of the blocks and everything. It's pattern recognition at a high speed. And the refresh rates on the old TVs would cause you to stare at the screen a lot longer. And you would sit there and concentrate on it and you would phase out. And that's what the Russians used back way in the, way in the day to, to train your soldiers. Now, Matthew, why, why do you believe that it could not have been used on, on David Crowley? Because I knew David personally. I, I knew him. In, oh, you in, did? Okay. I mean, we, when we were overseas, I mean, I, I had conversations with him constantly. 
And I mean, he, he never exhibited or exhibited any type of mind control or not being controlled. Right. Up till the point where he decided to murder his whole family himself and write Allah Akbar on the wall. That, that, yeah. that is why I, 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 I hypothesize that it could have been possible that they, they just zapped the fuck out of him. I don't know. But I just want to hear your take. <laughs> as far as direct energy weapons are concerned, I mean, I can, I have, I have video upon video and, and, and information on those on my TikTok, and it's like they exist. And it's when when they speak of it, we're not just talking about just direct energy weapons that are up in the atmosphere. We're talking about weapons that are done with electromagnetics. We're talking about weapons that are made with plasma or you know liquefied glass that are right. Electromagnets at, at, at supersonic speeds. I mean, they're on naval ships. You have guys explaining these military weapons in, in extraordinary detail about their they're virtually silent, and they can travel great distances. And before you even know you're being hit by one, you're you, you're already at a cyclic rate. They're already firing more shots at you. <laughs> and where it gets you're right, you're exactly right. Uh, go up, uh, real quick. Uh, where it gets conflated and, and it changes that. A lot of, of mentally ill people out there who are claiming this is happening. Uh, so it, it takes away from the legitimacy of this actually going on with those type of people. Well, you know, you, you look look at look at the Manchurian candidate, you know. Um, you know, Sinatra was in the first one and then Denzel Washington and uh, the other guy was in the last one. But, you know, you watch the Manchurian candidate, then you go to uh, Jolly and MK Ultra. And they had a hookers in San Francisco that leads all the way to uh, the Mansons with the MK Ultra. Yeah, you know that stuff might have been going on. But what I kind of agree with Matthew is if, if you're if you're a Manchurian candidate, you know there's going to be something when you serve. You know it's like football when I play semi-pro or when you're a cop. You know you 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 know what these people better than your family. And so if something's going on. You, you, in that, in that, uh, in that perspective of, of your service, you know, um, there, there, I, I don't, you know, look, look at the, the, look at the Havana syndrome, where they used uh, uh, RF for energy pulsating signals uh, to, and then people test. It was on 60 Minutes and totally believable. And Matthew knows more about it than I do. But you know, if they want to get you, can they, can they do that with, you know, energy weapons? Yeah, they probably can. But I think Matthew would have noticed. Uh, some sort of dichotomy or difference between David's personality. I mean, you know, more than anybody else. I was I was mostly wondering if if he noticed a difference in David's personality during those last few weeks where he was murdered. I, I didn't have contact with him at that point, so I didn't notice anything. Oh, I, so, I, I it, no so it could it, it's a possibility out there that yeah, it could. Have been. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I, I you know what I, I mean I I agree. I don't I I you know it's I don't know, but. Well, well, you would, I mean, the whole crime scene would have been different, though. It would have been clean. You wouldn't have had three different crime sloppy, scenes in, right. in the scene. It wouldn't have been so sloppy if it was a Manchurian candidate or well, any like MK Ultra, right? We, well, we would no, have had, well, hey, he did it and. Not no, necessarily, maybe Greg. Not. Okay, because, maybe. Well, no, you know, they might be able to, to send it with, with electro pulse signals of the Havana syndrome or whatever. And you turn into a robot and you go, you know, it tells you to kill your family like Manchurian candidate did with other officers and such. But, you know, um, you know, it, it's it kind of like being it's almost related to AI now, a robot doing, you know, only X, Y, Z. But um, uh, I, I, the bullet in the ceiling still I question in the, mo the motivation. And I think, they, you know, if, they, if David was really this depressed or whatever, he would have just went out in the backyard and ate his gun. He wouldn't have taken his yeah. family out. You know. Spot on, spot on with that, and and bringing up these types of things, which a lot of the general public still doesn't think we're being sprayed and such. But yeah. I digress. Um, yeah. You can call them what you want. I say geoengineering, but uh, <laughs> that that just gives us kind of the Looney Tune look, like the flat Earth look, that type of thing. Um, yeah. When we talk about that, but I've always in the back of my head, I always thought, man, this guy, he just got all the funding he needed. He was. He was charging straight ahead to make this movie, and then suddenly all this stuff didn't add up. It added up to somebody who just freaking had a flip switched in his head. I don't yeah, know. But, you know what? No. I don't interrupt you, but um, a case I, I didn't work it, but my old boss, Don Crutchfield, was the uh, private investigator to the stars. His old man was was a wheel man. He was on the wrong door raid with Sinatra. 
DiMaggio and Lawford when they were spying on Marilyn Monroe in the 40s. So I go back a ways on the L.A. Wheelman PIs. Um, but uh, uh, look at he, he his last case before he died it was the Gary DeVore case where he was a screenwriter. And he wrote, uh, I think he didn't do Ter Terminator, but he was one of Arnold's movies. He just they called the screenwriter with no hands. They found him in, a, in a, outside Riverside in an aqueduct two years later with no hands. That, you know that that that's a, that. There's something there's something uh, uh, methodical religiously or whatever with no hands, and that, that's how Kamel was. And David had lost a hand. There's that 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 that's that, that's a sign. That that's a message. You know, and Gary Gary DeBoer, they found him in the aqueduct with no hands, but they said it, they said it was an accidental uh, crash. You know. Sure. Yep. Very familiar with that. I, I've always thought, are, are we hurting the case or helping the case bringing up uh, the direct energy weapon? I, I think people That's need to you know, people need to people need to be educated on that. And you know that that and like Matthew will tell you that 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 that's that's thirty year old technology, right? <laughs> I'm probably older, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. That that's a whole other that's a, like a whole other podcast. You can right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, some of the stuff that they're showing us now for, for these weapons for these different types of control over people is is nothing new. It's just been in, improved over the years. Right. I mean, we were doing mind control experiments on soldiers back in the twenties and thirties, so that yeah. way, you know, not sleep and, and continue the mission, but they were having issues with it because you, you've seen in TV shows and different movies and comic books, you know, if you take away sleep, you know, soldiers retaliate and they, they break down. And well, that, that's why with Hitler, Hitler, when he had got everybody, when they had the speed, I forget, it was not with the P, Pentadrone or whatever, and it got everybody on there. And during, after the Blitz, they found a lot of Nazi uh, planes that had crashed that were shot down is because they were so sleep deprived over like four or five days, they became lousy pilots. And that's, yep. that, yeah, that, that, if you look into the, into the, um, um, the meth and amphetamines when hit, I mean, that started back in like 2019, 20, you know? Yeah. And, and then that's what they and did. Amphetamines, so, meth, right. Yeah. You can also justify that with the um, Air Force pilots. I can't remember the, the time frame, but the Air Force pilots that fired on um, their own while in country, I think it was either Iraq or Afghanistan, and they admitted to being on go pills. Oh, yeah, yeah. They give them, they, they, they're on controlled, uh, controlled Adderall. <laughs> yeah, you know, a, a, friend of, a friend of mine was a pilot uh, with Air America back in the day, and they called them greenies, but they're not going to, you know, and we're talking C-130s and stuff, but they put you in a, they're not going to put you in a fighter plane if you're tired. And, and this, this is a half a billion dollar, uh, you know, vehicle, you know, you better be wide awake, you know, and, and but every, 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 not to get off the subject, but every war with every infantry and everything else had something to boost them. Every, even we did. During Vietnam, I know guys, they, they said that their ammunition guy and the M60 behind them, he'd line out Bismarck's of meth. And because, you know, that's the only way they could go in there and survive in the jungle, you know, and it made, it made them alert. I mean, they paid for it later with their habits, but that's the only way they survived, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Stephen, it's impossible uh, to get off topic. Stephen Crawley covered all these topics. That, that's... <laughs> let me attempt this because I do want to hear from, from Catherine here because um, I think Eric brought up a great question that, Catherine, I'm sure you've heard many, many times. Was David Crowley under mind control? If he was, okay, then, you know, any, any thoughts on that? And, and <laughs> yeah, because I, I spent a lot of time studying psychology in college. Um, that's the thing that people don't understand is a human mind is very, very strong. It takes a lot, not only to break the body, but to break the mind. And, you know, they watch movies like Mentoring Candidate and they're like, oh, that's it. They're perfectly normal and everything's great. And then they get this one word and they all of a sudden they turn into this killing machine. That's not really how it works there. Usually you will see something different in a behavior. They will start to either get real paranoid or you'll see a change like what Matthew was saying, which was, I want, I wanted to, to ask Matthew. It's like, there are, are videos of David, you know, either speaking at the Ron Paul things or just being interviewed. Um, 
and, and that came pretty close before the death. So by watching him do these videos, do you see anything different? Do you see a man who all of a sudden looks crazy? No, he was he was thoroughly excited. He was thoroughly, he was he's a creator, an artist who's on his way. I mean, for anybody who's been in the industry or and working in film or animation or video games, when, when your game or your vi film comes to light and people are actually interested in the story and producing it and putting money into it, that is a huge step in the industry. So I saw no change in him. That's, it, a, that's a great point she brought up though, because you had said yourself Matthew, that you didn't have contact with him for a couple of weeks. And, and towards the end, when it, it, it seemed like the people were noticing a lot of changes in him. David Crowley was being paranoid about people around him, which he should be, because uh, yeah, with uh, with all due respect, he should be getting paranoid around the people about the people around him at that time. But we did, some of them, some of the people, right? So, uh, Catherine, as far as as what you had just said, this is a uh, this is a guy who we did see. And you guys have shown it a, a decline or not a decline, but a, a definite change of personality in the well, last. It was years. a change in priorities. I, I because priority. I see the only thing change I see different. Yeah. In his quote unquote personality is he and he states this in his own journal. He's like, OK, I'm cutting ties with these people who are just trying to suck things from me. They want to to ride on my coattails. They want me to take them to L.A. They want to get famous because of my work. And I'm not doing that anymore. I, I don't need you people. And that is a far cry from someone. Who, right. You know, I agree. Yeah, right. That's the first crazy. news realizing what what's going on around him. Yeah, but you know the, 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 the first. The, I mean, I just got off a pitch pitch with two projects after the after the Hulu deal and everything. It's just to get a David just to get a pitch in Hollywood is a huge step for any project. To sit down with a, the producers that want to take a shot at you, whether it goes or not. I mean, that that's like ten percent of the people that write screenplays. I mean, every everybody in LA has a screenplay. Every waitress has a screenplay. Right. But to get the pitch. And then to, to get moving on, it's it's really hard to get a green light. My buddy Eddie Barbini just did the Fauci thing for um, uh, Masterpieces on PBS. And I pitched him a couple projects two weeks ago. With, one of them was a Crowley case we're going to come, come up on. And after this Fauci thing, which I thought he's going to get an Emmy on it, I guarantee it. He told me they don't even have a secondary market that's interested after he just launched on PBS with Fauci, the biggest guy in the world. What does that tell you? David broke barriers that people don't understand. It's huge. And the other guys were on his coattails that had no idea what it takes to do that. Yep. Yeah, and exactly. And all those guys who were, um, when you're looking at the narrative, who is it that is saying that David went crazy and David snapped and he was going down the stark rabbit hole? All yeah, the, the ones that he project. was picking aside. Yep. yep. Every single one. He's like, nope, you're out of here. I'm getting rid of you. And they're the ones who now, and to, to have so many people follow this narrative and go, oh yeah, see, so-and-so, Danny says he was crazy. Sean said he's crazy. His own family. Well, yeah, these are all people who wanted stuff. And he said, no, no more. Yeah, absolutely. You look, at, you look at the mics, you look at Hollywood and they're all like, this was the most put together man we ever saw. But yeah. do they want to pay attention to that? No, because it doesn't fit the narrative. And I can add to that because it, as as being as serving with David as as him being one of my NCOs, one of his quintessential parts of him was that he was very organized. He was very on point with everything he did in the military, with weapons, with any training with us, how he presented himself, his professionalism as a soldier and as a mortarman. And when he had enough of something, he let you know, and he did it in his own way. And I could go on an, an entirely different story about how he presented himself while we were in Afghanistan. Uh, keep going. I mean, David was one of your NCOs? Yeah, he was wow. one of Wow. Oh, keep going with that. <laughs> I served with him uh, directly. Um, <clears throat> and I remember he was having troubles while he was in Afghanistan. He wasn't getting paid. I remember being at uh, uh, Fob Can or Kandahar, the Air Force base, before it was overrun. And... Uh, he was he was not receiving pay and i noticed that he wasn't with the platoon anymore so i i asked him i was like hey bro what happened like you're, you're not with us he's like oh i, I quit i i asked to be moved to the mailroom i was like that that's 
that is very strange. Like what happened? And he went on to tell me what was going on. He wasn't getting paid back home and he had just had enough. You think, you, you, Matthew, you think they might have, uh, they might have bumped him up though and he, when he went into the company? I'm not sure what his promotion status was at that. I know he was in line for E6. I do know that, but I'm not sure any more beyond that portion of it. But he definitely just was going through a hard time while he was in Afghanistan. It was not easy to be there. That was his second tour, though, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah. You can't blame him, though, anybody, you know? Well, no, because I, I was, I mean, I got to the unit three weeks right out of basic training. And these guys had been together for a year and a half doing you know, drills and working together and, and developing the camaraderie. So I showed up very late and, you know, they all took me in under their wing. And, and David did especially because we had a connection because we were both a, a very physically oriented CrossFit, anything else we would work out together constantly. And it was just a great camaraderie we had together. So, well, yeah. it sounds to me like David had some cojones, you know, because at oh. the time, you know, my husband, who, you know, was military at the time, and when he got called up to, you know, first it was Desert Shield, then Desert Storm, and we weren't getting paid either. And he was just, an, I think, in maybe E3 or E4. So, you know, we didn't have any money. And so when I'm back stateside, my husband's over there in the war and we're not getting not only deployment pay, we got no, you know, you're getting the basic pay of an E3. And, and he never stood up for it. And I'm like going, I can't pay the bills. And you, you know, you know how the military is. And I'm not going to get into that because it's a whole nightmare. But if you, the wife isn't taking care of things at home, then you need to yell at the wife. And, and it's, it was all them. And so I kept telling my husband, you got to go talk to them. You know, you're getting in trouble. I'm getting in trouble and it's their fault. And he never did anything, but here, David, he had the cojones to go in there and say, Okay, I quit. You guys aren't going to be pay me. I'm done. Mm -hmm. That took a lot. It did. It, it certainly did. And it, it changed the dynamic of the platoon. Because I remember when he spoke to First Sergeant Christopherson, it was just like, first, or excuse me, uh, Sergeant First Class Christopherson at the time. I mean, he was a fair and balanced uh, platoon leader. He was a great leader. And even he was sad to see David go, but he didn't stop him. I mean... David needed to get out because he needed to you know, get paid for what he was doing and, and dealing with some of those, those guys who had been to the first insurgency of the Iraq war, they were under a different type of stress uh, for most of us who are just coming in to the military. They, they didn't have ROEs like we did when we went to Afghanistan. They didn't have that kind of rules and regulations. They, 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 they didn't have the intelligence then either, did they? No, they didn't have a lot of the military intelligence that they, that we have now. But it was it was a totally different aspect. The rules were different. You know, you, I, I remember talking explicitly to some of the other soldiers, uh, uh, Eric Duplissa, who was saying, "Yeah, I mean, you know, the car rolled up on us when we first went to Iraq. You know, we would you know, shoot the engine block out with the you know, 50 cal. We wouldn't even ask questions. And then all of a sudden, you roll around to the time I went to Afghanistan, and we have to." put out you know roe signs and raise our hands and throw rocks it's like <laughs> it, it, it just didn't work <laughs> oh, man. it was a very interesting time we actually walked around some of the bases uh you know we weren't even amber like we, we would walk around green with no magazines and our weapons and i'm like what are we gonna do throw them at them i mean it just makes no sense i mean yeah, they got mad at us for walking around red a lot of the time, but you know we were in open desert for a lot of our tour while we were building fob ramrods. So it just made no sense with the changes in the ROEs and the the directives for the SOPs. It just you know. And you mentioned Duplissa. Now, do you talk to him about I, I, about David? Because I've seen a photo or two of him with David. You know, I've, you know, I've lost contact with a lot of those guys. Um, Actually, it's very interesting you mentioned that because one of my best friends out here in Alabama, uh, and we served together as well and, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So he's really one of the only people that I've stayed in contact with over the years. Um, it, uh, it's very strange how the military is a small world. You lose contact with a lot of these guys because the demons that we face for survivor's guilt, PTSD, however you want to look at it, 
we, we don't like showcasing our feelings for the how people view us like that statement that she said in, in, in the book that he looked crazy well that's a common stigma that most veterans get that's and it's not mad. always true and it's not always true like i mean I, I served in iraq and afghanistan i mean do i look crazy to you guys no <laughs> i mean no and you guys have talked to me on, on on different levels through different communications it's like david presented himself as a professional in the military and and whenever i put on the uniform i wasn't just representing myself just like david was he was representing the united states army and we all took that into account but just like in any profession you're always going to have people who have the rank but not the maturity have the the way of doing things but not not the understanding of how to treat people so professional and, and not only that soldiers are not you know, just they, they do not respond the same. Like, for example, um, when I was in Fort Bragg and I just was, I think I just passed my national registry exam and there was um, an accident on the tarmac. I can't remember which plane hit a seat 130. Right. So there were soldiers there. It, a big firebomb. You could see the smoke all over Fayetteville. So I'm looking at this going, oh, holy crap, there, there's something happened over there. And um, it, I couldn't get in until the next day. So when I got um, to, the, to, the, to the hospital and stuff, and of course, there were injuries, just re uh, um, a massive amounts, just about anything you could think of. Most of them were burns. But I still remember seeing, as I'm going through the ward, that there were soldiers who, you know, broken bones and limbs due to things flying and those who had half their body burned off and just how each one responded differently. It didn't necessarily depend on the type of wound they had. It was how they individually responded. There were some that were, you know, catastrophic injuries and they're just like laughing and joking. They're having a great time. And just one soldier who lost part of his ear and some of his face catatonic for months so you know to have people lump like people like david or maybe even you and say oh they're just suffering from ptsd they lost their mind because they went to war it is such a miscarriage of justice and in to to put you guys into that situation it takes so much strength to do what you guys do and what you did i don't think you guys get enough credit well and you should also get get paid I think we would all agree that you should get paid. And I'd like to hear more about that. How does David Crowley find himself in a spot where he is serving, where he's over here? How the heck, how does that even happen where you're, you're over there in harm's danger and you're not getting paid? I, I feel like I, I didn't. It has to all to do with the books on how they do their accounting. We, it was the same thing with us. My, my husband. Really? Time, getting paid either. Well, that it, happens does, it happens a lot. It happens more. a lot. Wow. That out to what Catherine was saying to That's lump ridiculous. everybody into this little group, just like a, I know a little group called conspiracy theorists, <laughs> all lumped into the same group. Mm -hmm. Indeed, um, one of the, one of the big things that was in the military, especially with financing, is is that paperwork gets lost all the time. You know, if you fill out a leave form and someone doesn't like you, they'll tear it up and make you do it again. If they don't like you, they'll lose your paperwork. I've seen guys change you know, documentation just so that they can get into different schools because they're, they're missing one point on their uh, GT score or something like that. Like, just because we don the uniform, it doesn't mean that all people are, you know, sunshine and rainbows and not going to cheat, steal, lie and get what they need to get ahead. Yeah. And if you remember, I, I don't know if you, how old you guys were, but when Desert Shield then turned into Desert Storm, and then I think it was Saudi Arabia, it was one of those countries who then sent a whole bunch of gold medals to give to every single soldier that was in that particular. My husband happened to have been over there. And do you know that every single enlisted guy had their, the medals were taken, but all of the, the um, senior officers, like the colonels and, and master sergeant, they all, they got theirs. But our soldiers were told, no, you can't have that. That's a bribe. So oh, we got crazy. nothing. What? Our families got what? nothing, and our husbands didn't even get the medals. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
It's ridiculous. That's it was. Ridiculous. We we were. I mean, if I if I if I work at a um at a fast food restaurant and if they're not paying me, I I'm gonna quit and I, that's it. But I mean, these people, these soldiers, these you know, they signed their life, signed their life away. For our freedoms, which to me, I, I've had family, you know, and, and served during this this same same time. And they're they're taking all of these shots. They don't know what's in these shots, but they are being forced to take these all of these oh, shots. You're walking they, the line to get your they're, station banned. <laughs> they're, they're giving up their their freedoms to protect ours. And it's just it's just it frustrates me when I hear that people aren't being paid. That really bothers me. Buy, buy a freaking cheeseburger, man, if you take one. <laughs> And they make more than us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it was hard because you know back then and at that time this this is some personal information, so I, most people don't know. But I have multiple sclerosis, so at the time I was really sick and I couldn't even walk. I couldn't even get up to do anything. Um, since you know I've gone through a lot of physical um, rehab and stuff, so I can walk now. But back then I couldn't. I, I couldn't even get out of bed to fix. And I had two little kids, and so I couldn't take care of them. You couldn't buy them food. Couldn't pay the bills. And we're telling you know I'm telling my husband. I'm like going get this fixed. We can't do this. We, what am I going to do? And then, um, the, I ended up in the hospital. So now I'm in the emergency room. They're admitting me because I was so sick. And then the, then the red cross contacts, you know, his, his base where he was over in Iraq and they had to send him home. Well then talk about the stigma. You, you know, he then was shunned because he took the easy way out. He came back. He didn't finish his first tour over there. And it's such BS that these soldiers go through. When I tell you, I mean, my heart is for the military guy. I know what these guys do. I know what they have to go through. I know what they live through because I lived it. Not, not necessarily everything, everything they did because I didn't have to go to war. But I was a military spouse for 10 years. And our... Our guys are phenomenal. Our men are amazing. So when people come after David and they want to say that because he was in the military, he was some, you know, he snapped, dude, I will rip your head off because I know I've seen guys who have lost their shit. I've seen people who have, well, you don't snap. There's a buildup. There's no such thing as we're walking down the street, snap. I'm going to go kill everybody. But I don't know. I'm going to go off on a tangent. Sorry, but don't don't attack David if you don't know what the hell you're talking about. I'm going to tell you to shut the hell up. It's, it's, it's a very, very... I, I've dealt with that stigma a majority of you know, my, my time after being out of the military and uh, you know altercations and everything else. But I, I will tell you one thing. If, 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 if anything I learned from the military, it's, it's to control one's emotions control your ego and assess the situation. I, I can, I can tell you as an infantryman, I had to make those, those types of choices many times in my career. And, you know, David was a excellent practitioner at his job. And I learned a lot from him to be a waterman. I basically went from basic training to Fort Hood for three weeks and then deployed to Afghanistan. I, I got the baptism through fire. So I had to know my job and he, he made it possible for me to be accepted into the unit uh, as, as a, a brand new soldier for basic training. And I, I grew to really develop a, a great camaraderie with those men. It was a phenomenal time in my life. Yeah, because you're right. Usually when you're a newbie coming into a group of guys who've been together with all the training, you're not generally accepted right away. So to have David take that step forward to not only welcome you, but then to make you as the NCO, like not only part of the group, but to be in charge of the group, that's huge. It seemed to me David had a problem with one of those um one of those things you're supposed to do with, as a military person, and that was to follow orders because he decided that some of the orders he was following were horrific. Yes, I, I can attest to that. Um, you know, we're, we're supposed to follow lawful orders. 
and you know when, when you're when you're on a convoy and you are constantly seeing young children and you know, people on the streets and everything going through the desert and they're throwing rocks at you they're doing all kinds of things you have to be in in a matter of nanoseconds be able to make the decision whether you're going to take someone's life or not and i'll tell you with untrammeled certainty that there wasn't a time over there that i wasn't in some type of mission or combat situation where i didn't feel fear okay i was there was definitely fear involved but it's the fact that we kept pushing forward because we knew that the guys to our left and our right were going to be there for us through and through anybody who go, joins the military and says that they went through a firefight and they weren't scared of full of shit. That's just straight truth for you. Who would have thought that David would have returned from those horrific scenes and went into even more horrific scene? It's just, it, wow. Thank you guys. It's an honor and a privilege to be on this broadcast with both Matthew and Stephen. I'm just thank, glad thank Catherine and Greg, of course, but it, no, just, no, no, those two, you know, you got it. I no, I appreciate everybody here because we, we're all adding in our own expertise to the, to the situation. And just because I need David personally doesn't make me any more special than anybody else here on this panel. We all have some type of information to provide everybody else who's looking into this case and the uh, veridity of it. it it's just give you credibility, though. Yes, that's yeah. true. And I just like to make it known that, that, that none of this is from pride or ego. This is all to bring justice for David because the man was just brilliant. And I learned so much from him. I mean, there are two major figures in my life that made me into the NCO that I became and the professional that I was in the military. And that's, you know, Michael Williams and David Crowley. They were two men that I looked in the face when I met them. And I was just like, in the back of my mind, it's just like, I want to be like that when I grow up. Okay. I want to be like these men because they were respected. They were sought after for information, but they didn't go around banging their own drum. It was never about pride for them or ego. It was just about being the best version of themselves that they could. And I wanted to emulate that. Eric, you're muted. Yeah, that, that's a tough. Uh, that's tough to follow, right there. Well said. You know, that just having nice. real men, real men. We're still real men here on this broadcast. Very nice to be a part of it again. Well, you think of so many soldiers who have served us, and so many people that are going to continue to serve us, and what they are going through, what they have gone gone through, and it is just so frustrating when. You know, we, I, when people think of soldiers, I don't want them to to think that David Crowley, that soldiers just automatically they have they all have PTSD and they all end up killing themselves and they all end up killing their families. And they're all killers. <laughs> and they're all kill. I mean, it's just it's just crazy. And yeah, then apparently everybody has the PTSD right now. Right. <laughs> they're upbringing. I mean, everybody can freaking claim that now, not just soldiers. Soldiers have seen things and gotten through it. Well, didn't, out, didn't they used to just call that? Didn't they used to just call that shell shell shock? Shell shock. Uh, right. I mean, that's it. It was all. I mean, whatever they want to put this label on it and say, okay, well, that that's it to kind of simplify it for people who don't want to do research, who don't want to actually look into this and actually treat this guy as if he's innocent. And so, yeah, when when you hear these 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 um, words where they say he's crazy, he's crazy. When you hear it from a family member, that's frustrating. When you hear it from a police officer, that's very frustrating too. You know, I mean, because you, I, I mean, how many times would you want, should a police officer say that, you know, and say it on camera, say yeah. it on camera and say, this guy went crazy. Yeah. Let's ask Steven about that. Steven, yeah, how often Steven. should a police officer say something like that? How do you hold back? <laughs> Well, no, you, 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 so, so, rephrase the question for me. Well, I mean, how many times have you heard, uh, you know, or how many? How if, often? 
how how often should we say, well, this guy went crazy? A police this officer, yeah. As a if police you're... officer, are there aren't there oh, any standards? You don't you you you, you don't say that. <laughs> that's it, you know. And if you say it privately, that's one thing. But if you say it publicly in front of a camera, yeah, no, no, you, you no, no. What, 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 that crazy? That's a that's a broad brush, man. I mean, crazy for what? Crazy this? I mean, that that doesn't narrow it down. That's just the real uh, quick, uh, 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 you know, one word explanation. Crazy, and it ends it ends it right there. What's the definition of crazy? I'm crazy. Right. You're, we're all crazy. Probably all crazy or, for doing podcasts. Or that's, I, not, I, that's, not, you know, that, that's not a reason. Correct. You know, <laughs> or or no, saying, yeah, saying you know, saying that 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 someone snapped. He killed his family. He killed yeah, him no. himself. I mean, come on. That's not what police officers should do. That's not what no, they're no, paid you, you to do. You, yeah, you, no, you don't. You don't say that. No, heck, no. There's a certain level of professionalism that everybody has to take. And when any law enforcement officer or any military personnel uses language like that, that is strictly to drive a narrative. Right. And that's how important language is. I mean, they they don't call it you know the sword of the spirit for nothing. The words, words have meaning words have meaning and it's like just like any laws that are written or any any lawyer will tell you the way that the language is written is you remove certain parts of speech to make it so that way it can be a contractual format that's the whole business with language and that's why lawyers are hated so much is because their use of vernacular that's <laughs> right and, and you, you follow the rhetoric and you see the lines you can use language to your advantage to manipulate anybody so when a police officer gets in front of a camera and tells thousands of people that this guy was crazy hmm. that drives home a narrative and the first thing people go oh there it is another veteran went nuts like oh let's add that and it's like Hold on, wait, wait a second. Conspiracy theorist veteran. Yeah, on top of that. You guys are nuts for thinking like that. Wait a second. Can't anybody have PTSD? I mean, I think somebody made the claim a while ago that they got PTSD from the comments they were reading on the internet. Wow. Anybody can 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 receive PTSD. I made that comment. That's that's the <laughs> thing now. Right. It's not PTSD. It, it's literally the stigma behind it has made. I mean, I'll use myself as an example, but I mean, I went through hell and high water when I was asking for help back in 2009. I mean, it was, it was absolutely ridiculous. You know, you had guys who were, were saying, oh, you should just suck it up and drive on. You know, it's, it's, it's what we do. I'm like, man, the experiences you may have had, you got through or you're dealing with it in a different way, but some of us need some help with this. All right. And I've seen too many guys, too many females who have been crippled by their demons and they, they, they don't reach out because of the stigma behind it. And it's, it's almost an insult to, uh, to military who have, have gone through the most horrific things you can ever imagine for people to come out and use PTSD for anything that right. goes on in their life. My girl right. left me PTSD. Right? Yeah, that, that's just a hell out of here. Right, it's a weak-minded generation. Disgusting. Yeah, and I, there's a uh, there was a TikTok going around uh, about three or four months ago about uh, a gentleman calling nine one one and getting a female dispatcher, and he was, she says, you know, how can I help you? This is nine one one. He says, I'm I'm having flashbacks again of Vietnam and I'm holding a knife. I'm, I want to end it. And she talks him down, and you can hear the absolute anguish in this man's voice. Like he's got nothing left. He doesn't have family to help him. He doesn't have anything. And she talks him down. And this is a guy who served in the jungles of Vietnam. I mean, whatever I faced over there, I, I had technology beyond measure to protect me. I mean, my IOTV was, was a, you know, was full on bulletproof vest with side plates and shoulder pads and everything. Yeah, but you know, Matthew, you, you, Matthew, you volunteered, am I correct? Oh, yes. The difference between Vietnam and you guys serving over in the sandbox draft. is that the draft. There's guys that never should be drafted. It has to be. You know what? That's why we got to get stronger. You want to go into the military. I tested even, but decided I want to be a cop. 
but you want to go in. You don't want to serve next to a guy that doesn't want to be there. Right. right. That, that, that's the bottom line, man. Absolutely. So, and I knew guys who were there, and you could see it in their eyes. They weren't there to be an infantryman. They were there, or there to be a, for a paycheck. They were I there. Mean, there's going to be incentives to go in the military right now. Oh, yeah. And, and I won't lie. Like, and when I joined, I mean, I had already had my bachelor's degree. I, I got bonus on top of bonuses. for Bonus joining. on top of bonus. And yeah, when you get out, more bonuses to, yeah, to the tune of 50, 60, almost $100,000 for some people. Oh, yeah. Of incentives. But uh, they don't want to be there. The, the, uh, the bonus. That's what you're saying. They don't want to be there. They didn't want to be there. They were just doing it for the like, bonus. When it came to combat, it, that, <laughs> that's a different story than getting paid. Oh, yeah, because the bullets yeah, are. You know look, look, look at that. Look at that guy, Everson from Soundgarden. He, he after after he, they kicked him out of Soundgarden, he was with Nirvana and in Soundgarden, he went in and he signed up and, and, and went over to the the sandbox. You know, I mean, I, I, I mean, great interview with Joe Rogan. I give yeah. hands. Wait, I mean, one of the guys from Soundgarden? Yeah, the guy from Soundgarden went in there and he was he was in the ship. We're not talking about Chris Cornell, right? Who was obviously no, not Chris Cornell. No, the guy, the, no, pornography. no, not Chris Cornell. No, no, it's it's it, it was his bass player. He he, he yeah, you no, know, he was with Nirvana then Soundgarden, and but he's what's his name? I think I think it's Everson or Everson. Yeah, it's oh, just, the, the the guitarist. He was a bass player with Soundgarden and Nirvana, and what's after he was out of my bad yeah, for interrupting. Yeah, I'm Joe, taking Joe, notes. Yeah. But he, I mean, I, I give that guy my hats off to that guy. Yeah, I mean, when I, I joined, didn't know that. Yeah, that you had I mean, you had Chris Cornell, an activist against child trafficking, who hung himself supposedly, where his knees. Yeah, yeah. Around. And then yeah, you had another fun. person from Soundgarden that was equally awake. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it, it is fascinating that you know. Put aside that everything that 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 is happening right now. Let, let's put aside all of it, right? Let's look at what's the truth behind it. It's it's all a narrative, and it's all to to show us that control is by the elites. And and, and this is a show, sure case of that with what David went through. If if you have information that people don't want out there, they're going to find a way to make it so you can't get it out there. And that's up until including your life, which is what happened with David. And, and he had information that I'll share with you guys it, it, that would astonish anybody at that time period. I mean, the underground dumb bases, the child trafficking, everything else in his classified documents leading up to, you know, pipelines and everything else. I mean, he had information that people shouldn't have. And that's what got him killed. Yeah, and what better way to discredit what he was going to tell the world? Tell everybody he's crazy. Well, that's, what, that, that's right. But, you know, he, he had information. Maybe Matthew had some of or whatever. But David took it one more step and uh, 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 created a project that the whole world might see. Yep. Because there's guys like Matthew that, you know, do little here or there. We're doing our thing here. David was going to announce this to the globe, the world, man. Here, here's, you know, this is my project and everything else. And it, 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 like I said, it was going to ruffle some feathers because he took what a lot of guys maybe knew, but he put it into uh, the content and context of something that's going to be, you know, called entertainment or what have you, that uh, is going to is going to cause a, a you know a storm. You know, a ripple. Boom! 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 Drop a pebble in a pond, you get ripples. Boom! 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 Like seriously, like he bro. nailed it. <laughs> yeah, I mean. It, it, it's like you, know, you put on the full armor of Yahweh and you're going to get fired a dark shot at you no matter what. And he was trying to speak the truth. And, and that's all we, we need to do. And no matter how you slice it, he was on his way. Yeah. He was a brilliant young filmmaker on his way. And I couldn't, I couldn't have been more proud of him when he actually, you know, remembered that, you know, hey, oh, this guy went to animation school. Let me, let me see what he thinks about this. And he would call me up and I would have conversations with, with you know, Mitch and him and talking about like tank tread animations for like the opening sequence of the trailer. And I was just like, hey, let me see what I can do here. It was fantastic times. He was so excited. <laughs> 
let's uh let's let's talk a little bit ab about those talks then um uh so you've actually spoke with mitch heil too oh yeah we had conversations uh, when i was back in ohio when they were working on um, hard surface modeling for the tanks um back in that time period of like 2009 2010 um a lot of uh computer modeling programs were having trouble with uh, hard surface modeling, like, you know, metallic objects or anything that had to do with you know, armor or with a very, like, different type of shape or an armor type of shape. So they would, they would contact me if I made tanks, make it look more realistic, the animation of the treads, because uh, if anybody who's done any type of Python scripting or JavaScripting or any type of scripting in 3D animation programs, it, it's not easy. And you have to... It's not plug and play like it is now. You actually have to design the actual animation feature on the actual model to, to work with the actual animation that you're trying to produce. So they were saying, how do we get these tank treads to work? And I was like, hey, let me see what I can find. And I went to the forums and, you know, who knew it? This, this one coder who's a nerd like me was just like, hey, I got a tank tread animation thing to work and you can use it on your models. It's a free script. And I like looked at it and I was like, hey, maybe this will work for you. And they ended up using it. It was fantastic. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, was that some of the stuff that was in the 2012 trailer or some of the... Yeah. yeah. Uh, Wow. When the tank, like, yeah. the screen right there, that's all 3D animated with uh, the animated script that, uh, that I had uh, helped them with uh, that way back then. Wow. I didn't the script or anything. I just helped them find it, and I did some tweaks and stuff to the NLX, actual animation process, and actually helped them out with it so they could use it. And uh, it, it turned out really well in that, in that in the trailer. Hey, so, Matt, Matt. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Greg, no, I'm ahead. sorry. I was just going to ask Matthew a question. Yeah. Matthew, did uh, did David did David uh, speak about uh, a, a, this this project or something similar while you guys were serving together? Oh yes, I mean he talked about um, his T-shirt company. We were uh, talking about different designs and different ideas for that. I think it was called Bullet Time for the um, or I, I can't remember what the T-shirt company was over the years, but it's been a while. But I remember that conversation and that he was putting together a film and. Did you want to work on it? Did you want to help? I mean, when, I, when we were, when we got back to Fort Hood, he was ETSing and he, and he found out that I was, that I had re-enlisted and he was like, you're, you're fucking stupid. Like, and that, was, that was his exact words. I was just like, I, my wife wanted to stay in and, and I've enjoyed the military. He was just like, man, I'm going full sail. I'm going to get my film degree. And I was like, hey man, if you ever need help with something, a project, and you can always contact me. And that's how we stayed in contact over the years. It was, it was phenomenal. So I know we've uh, talked about David in full sale a couple times. Um, so he goes from full sale, which is, is that like an, an online? Oh, no, he went to the actual physical campus at, in Florida. It's in Orlando, Florida. It's one of the, one of the most uh, prestigious film schools out there. And uh, it, the re the, the, literally the only reason I chose it for my, my, my master's degree is because David went there. And when my, uh, some of my instructors found out that David had been a, a, you know, a student there as well, they were very honored that, you know, fulfill, fulfilling my dream, but also prolonging David's memory because everything that I learned from him reflected in my life as a professional in, in, in that field because he was so passionate about it. Now, I had been in the field before he was, but he just brought a level of professionalism to the military that I had never seen before. And he brought it outside of that too in all of his works and his expertise with weapons and turning them into actual weapons that can fire blanks and everything was absolutely ingenious with the, uh, the, the different um, modifications he made to, to the weapons that he had. And he was showing me this stuff, like, you know, and it was absolutely fantastic. And then for him to come to me and ask me questions made me feel great because I had never really made it in the industry like he did. I was, I was just, you know, a TV animator that knew a lot about computers and, and I did a lot of freelance stuff, but he was actually in the doorway and it was so exciting to see a, a friend of mine make it. I was proud of him on a level that most people would probably show empathy or excuse me, em, uh, you know, jealousy or uh, empathy for it. I was more along the lines like, yeah, bro, you go. Like, this is rad. 
<laughs> Sorry I bounced out of there, but I heard part of it. No, that I just was wondering. Thank you. No worries. So um, any, uh, sorry, go ahead, Catherine. I was just going to say, so basically um, what I'm getting from you is David was an expert with weapons. He knew how to handle one. He knew what to do with one. He knew. Absolutely. I'll never forget it during base, during one of the operations we did. I handed him my uh, M4 with the, with the receiver uh, to the back. You know, I had, I had it locked in place. He's like, why is this like that? And I was just like, uh, I didn't know how to answer it properly. Because, you know, I, had, I literally had just gotten out of basic. And I was just like, this is what they have me do in basic. So I don't know. <laughs> he was just like, calm down. It's okay. Just next time, make sure your, your receiver is, is, is forward when you hand it in. And I'll do the check. And I was just like, roger that, son. And I mean, I, I never really heard the guy yell at all. He was just. He was very matter of fact. If he had to raise his voice, it was for a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe people, just because he was so direct, they would take it as, oh, he's yelling at me, but he's just being direct. Like, hey, you know. Stoic. I mean, a, a lot of people mistake my passion for anger or, you know, just <laughs> being on drugs when really in, in reality, <laughs> I'm just a happy person. And it's just the light that's inside us. And David had that same kind of energy. He just showed it differently. Were there, were there any times where David got angry or mad? In my experience with him over the years, I, I never had that kind of altercations with him. He was just very matter of fact, and we hung out. We ate at the chow hall together, and he was a normal dude. I never had any issues with him, just like he didn't have any issues with his father-in-law, really. So he was, he was your superior Yes, point, right? he was one of my NCS. He was one of my non-commissioned officers, E5, when I was an E4. So he was, he was an E6, E7? Uh, no, he was an E5 at the time. E5? Mm -hmm. Did he ever discipline you? Oh, no. no did, you ever see him, did you ever see him discipline other people? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> as far what did that as, look as like? Yeah, yeah, what did that oh, look like? <laughs> We could actually smoke people back then, and you know, <laughs> guys were being stupid and privates were being dumb. You know, he was out there, and he was just like, and he was being an NCO. <laughs> uh, can Can you think of any memorable moments, any worst case scenarios, best case scenarios, or anything that stands out? Uh, the The one thing that stands out to me is is that um, when I came to the unit, CrossFit was huge, and I had already been participating in CrossFit as a personal trainer. Uh, back before I had joined the military and as a professional fighter for MMA. And I came in and I had already had experience with it. So they were doing- Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I've done a lot with my life, guys. So it's, it's, you know, the military wasn't enough for me. I had to do other things too. We're going to have to connect after the show. <laughs> Find him on TikTok. Find him on TikTok. <laughs> we call yeah. that being a sucker for punishment. <laughs> it, it's true. It's just like people are like, why do you want to fight for a living? It's literally because, you know, it's the only time you can go into a cage, fight somebody, and not go to jail. It's boys <laughs> being boys. It's right. Just right. Boys it's being boys. boys. Man, we shake hands afterward. We go out and have beers. Yeah, the beer, right? Pat, you know, the That's a great right hook. Dude. <laughs> you know, that uppercut was brutal. But, yeah, um, great right hand, fucker. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> but I remember we were doing a CrossFit session there in, in, in Fort Hood. It was one of the first PT sessions I was there. And we were all wearing our plates. We were wearing our sappy plates. And um, uh, our IOTVs were doing pull-ups and running. And this one kid just wasn't doing the exercises right. He, I think his name was Cole. And he just couldn't do the pull-ups anymore. And, and Crowley brought him over and got him in push leading rest position. And just like, if you can't do the pull-ups right, you can't lift the dude out of the tank, you can't do your job, blah, 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 blah. You got to keep going. I mean, it was just awesome to see somebody else as motivated as I was for fitness. I was like, yeah, let's go. And it was just a great CrossFit workout PT session. <laughs> So instead of just yelling at him too, he's like saying, Hey, there's a reason behind why you need to be fit. Exactly. You gotta exactly. save your guys. Right. You gotta be able to, to to pick up a dude who's got an extra 36, 40 pounds on his body and lift him out of a burning tank or lift him out of a whatever situation you're in. And this kid was just weak minded, but then you know, I jump up on the pull-up bar and I'm just like knocking these out, and he's just like, Where the fuck have you been? <laughs> <laughs> Like I was just that I was that guy in basic where I was the you know, false motivation is better than no motivation at all. 
So, you know, <laughs> when you're in front, of, in front of a bunch of privates who just got back from you know, Christmas leave and you have to go back to basic and they don't want to be there. I mean, we had to do overhead arm claps for like 30 minutes straight. And I'm just in the front of the formation just going, let's go, can't smoke a rock. This is how we do it. Like, and everybody's like, I hate you. And I'm just like, oh, well, at least you hate me and not the drill sergeants. <laughs> hey, so, so, so Matthew, you, you had your bachelor's degree. Did they offer you OCS? Oh, yes. I was off, uh, offered a OCS um, direct select actually while I was in basic. And I kept getting the same um, wisdom from the other NCOs, my, drill, my senior drill instructor, Drill Sergeant Murphy and Drill Sergeant Doug Leash, that go enlisted first. Go enlisted for, for a few years and, and right. learn what it's like to be in the trenches and learn what it's like to be an NCO and then apply for OCS. Yeah, that, that makes sense, yeah. And, and, and so at that time, the powers that be or the commander, the, the captain that was in charge, who was also a, a SF, he was like, you know what, if, if OCS is available for you and you have this direct select option, I would take that. So I ended up taking his advice, but at the time, my GT score wasn't where it was supposed to be and I needed to get to a unit so I could start receiving some of my bonuses that I was uh, using to yeah. pay off my student loans. <laughs> So at that point, I just decided to go the NCO route. And then finally, um, OCS was uh, brought back to me in about 2010, around the time that uh, Sergeant Ziegler was killed at uh, Fort Hood. I was there that day, too. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I was on base that day. I was literally supposed to go with him that day to that. And I got called to a detail to unload furniture for some of the soldiers coming back. Somebody's yeah. looking up for you. Yeah, Yahweh. I wasn't supposed to be there. And uh, I, uh, I remember that day clear as watching my son being born. It was, it was horrific. I mean, I was literally two blocks away when it happened. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, less than that. <laughs> so it just, it just goes to show you that no matter what you do in this world, there's always somebody looking out for your best interests and it, it, it's outside of our understanding. Yep. That's right. For sure. <laughs> well, that may be a great place to end this here, unless anybody else has any other uh, comments or any, anything else that we want to cover. I know um, you had, <laughs> you had mentioned Mitch Heil. So <laughs> obviously I wanted to, uh, I was taking notes about that. Um, but because um, Mitch Heil and David Crowley signed up at, at the same time, so they were both part of it. I, I, any military experiences with Mitch Heil? Did I, did I miss that? Not, no, no. I did not know him personally in the military. I only knew him outside of it. But okay. I know that they both joined together at the same time, yes. Yeah, so and they were good friends at one point. Okay. Yeah. But uh, Mitch had come to me for help with the uh, tank animation. He, uh, we emailed back and forth and discussed it in uh, hard surface modeling. So I helped him out with that. All right. Well, um, definitely want to thank everybody for joining us here. If anyone has any final thoughts, any final anything else that, that they want to add to this. Um, otherwise, you know, I would love to have us all back um, in the future and we'll continue to talk about this case and i want to thank everybody for being here for caring about this case first of all for asking questions for answering questions and um uh matthew can you tell people where they can follow you where can they oh. follow you where can they find you certainly uh, you can find me on uh, mostly on tiktok right now i'm the warrior for yeshua i have uh, about 38.9 thousand followers right now and i do it to oh, yeah, I mean, I'm not big or huge. I, I don't do it for money. I do this to showcase the grace, love, and mercy of Yeshua HaMashiach as our Messiah, and I preach the, the good news uh, to anybody who will listen. And if I could, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to pray for everybody on the panel and for everybody here. So if I got to have you guys just buy your hands for just a quick second, let me just do that. Yes, sir. Master and creator Elohim of this divine matrix, I ask that you grant us your love, grace, and mercy upon all of these people here on this panel and everybody who's going through the tribulations of this life, because blood through you, Yahuwah, forever and ever, for giving us the glory of the kingdom of heaven and Messiah.
Amen. 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 Indeed. Thank, Thank you. you for having me, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. And all I want to do is show people the truth and bring justice for David. And if I can do that with proper language, love, grace, and mercy, then that's what I'm going to do. And I can see that in all of your eyes, that all you care about is the truth and bringing David's story to light. And I'm going to fight back tears, but I love the man. <laughs> and uh, if I could have him back, it wouldn't even be words. It would just be, I would just hug him. Are there, are there any other soldiers out there who may feel the same way you do, that may be willing to talk to us, that may be willing to just, just help us? Because he has been slammed so much. And it's, it's so unfair. And because I'm not a soldier, people, you know, like, oh, Greg doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to that. You know, I've watched First, First Blood, right? I, I've seen <laughs> I've seen these movies. But when you have people that have actually served with David, I have not found, well, aside from Joseph Seton, I've not found one soldier that is talking negatively about David Crowley to the point where they believe that David Crowley did this, that they believe David Crowley did this. I believe Joseph Seaton believes it, but I also think Joseph Seaton was also there. And I know you, you know who Joseph Seaton is too. Personally. This was, this is a guy who was, who was there, who was one of those people, David Crowley was kind of wiping off. And at some point he's like, dude, I can't deal with this. And we all have those, those. Yeah, exactly. Eric. <laughs> it's just like, I can't deal with this right now okay it doesn't mean we can't be friends later it doesn't mean anything else later but i mean at some point it's like david crowley was clearly distancing himself from some of these people it's sad that it was a soldier that david crowley had served with i guess so i don't know if you know and i know we've talked about this in our last conversation but any thoughts about the joseph seaton because what do we i don't know that much about him Before <clears throat> my emotions get the better of me, okay. uh, take a moment and just, I had an interesting professional relationship with, with Seton. I mean, from on the outside, everything looked good, but when I was contacted by him for helping him with something that he was working on in animation, and we had mentioned Crowley, he, his first response was, oh, he did it. He murdered them all. And I was like, what? Like, are you, are you serious? And that takes true courage, Matthew. To, to you know, and I mean, this I is like, to say that uh, right. And I was as far as the code. I was like, wait a second. I was like, hey, hey, you're still in, right? And he was just like, yeah. And and I was like, I'm I'm retired, bro. That's not how it happened. And and he didn't like that at all. He didn't like. You saw some flag. red flags. Um, you're you're not pointing fingers. You're just you saw some red flags. I that? saw red flags, and I was just like, "No, nah, man, this anybody can see right in front of him that this looks wrong." And he just did not like the way I was speaking about it. And I I was like, "Okay, well, that's your opinion, and I'm giving you mine. And I don't really care what you think anymore because you're not my superior." One <laughs> A, baby. <laughs> I mean, I may I may respect the rank, but that doesn't mean I have to like you as a person. <laughs> mm, true. <laughs> so as far as that was concerned after i you know did the work for him and didn't get paid imagine that <laughs> uh, <laughs> i uh i kind of just distanced myself from him because his narrative and his opinions were not in line with mine and i didn't like the energy he was putting out so i was just like you know what if if he believes that and this is how he feels i don't think i need to know you and i, I Cut ties many years ago. How many other soldiers do you think may feel the same way that you do or may feel the same way that Joseph Seaton does? If you had to guess, just, just a, in your uh, opinion. Hypothetical, I would say a majority of people probably think there was some type of foul play done with mm. Crowley's uh, murder. A, a lot of soldiers would think there was foul play. How many will step up to the mic and actually talk about it, though? They're afraid. Right. They're terrified. I mean. Why? You, Why? Because of what 
we have been happened to David. <laughs> that David. Happened. I mean, yeah. there's, there's, there's proof right there. And look at what other people, what's happened to other people who have been silenced. I mean, you said yourself that um, um, Eric has been banned on YouTube. I've been banned on TikTok for, for videos because people uh, thought I was uh, being racist. I mean, I, I you get you get all kinds of different. Well, you're white, so obviously you're racist. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, I'm all white. Right you're racist, racist automatically. About, you know, you know, flat Earth, or I'm talking about biblical cosmology or something like that. <laughs> Lags my account because I'm giving false information. It happens to all types of creators, and you know, as far as people thinking the way Seton did, I mean, I think a vast majority think that that it was. Uh, uh, murder suicide because they see the narrative and they're not willing to dig into it because it, it's it, it, oh it's right here it's right in front of my face that that, that must be the truth but you got to peel back the layers and that's the first thing I did when I when I when my wife and I and my ex-wife now told me about it she was like whoa something's not right here and I'm like yeah something is not right here David would not do this this is not the man I know. Not being so close to getting grace date. I mean, no way. <laughs> I have spoke with uh, Greg several times about possibly picking up parts of David's script and, and making it into a movie. We should. Um, well, that's <laughs> Greg. <laughs> we should. You got, you got, you got here you. Be able to freaking pick up where he left off. You got, well, you I got, mean, you got your expert panel here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the main thing is about it for real. You you have to get David's name cleared first. Yes, I don't I don't think that any any company any Hollywood maybe that Steven movie's not going to get made. Well, so <laughs> you can speak to this too. Is like who is going to want to fund a film where it, this was created by somebody that they say killed his his wife, killed his five year old daughter, and killed himself? Who is going to fund that? And that makes the whole Danny August Mason, all these people who tried to move forward with, with the project after David's death, that is a whole nother issue. But what Hollywood company in their right mind, and maybe the, we're talking about Hollywood, Holly weird, so maybe they're not in their right mind, but even those people. Only a company in their right mind would pick there it up. There's no company, even, even with everything happening in Hollywood, Stephen, what company is going to touch this project? Well, it, it, it's all private money now. There's no studios left. It's that what, who's, who's bottom line is uh, who's going to invest in something that's never going to be seen. Okay. That's it. I mean, then his narrative is like I said, it, it, it ruffled feathers and you know, I still think it's a black ops shadow ops hit that was done with amateurs. Agreed. And so, Agreed. I mean, yeah, he, he, yeah. Try to clear his name, but that's, there's never been a movie, movie made about Gary DeVore. You know, the, the screenwriter with no hands. There's been documentaries, but that's as far as it goes, you know. In addition um, to who's going to pick it up, who, who's yeah. going to actually have the balls to make it? I mean, when yeah, you're he, sacrificing he, he, your life and your, your family's right. life. Well, exactly. The guys, that, the guys that did the documentary on Gary DeVore, all of a sudden, they made it at the very end of the documentary. Now this guy's scared. He talked to Gary DeVore's wife. He went to L.A. He's from England. It's a great documentary. But at the end, he admits that he lied, and he didn't lie. But they made him right. do that. They, they threatened his family. Admitted so, it. Exactly. So with this here, Netflix, Hulu, Sony, Spot, whatever. There's no platform that's going to take it. They're not going to touch it. You know. Right. right. But if you, but if you soften it down a little bit, and take out, you know, the the Terminator, Transformer, you know, I, I think there's a little too much shoot 'em up stuff. But if you go with it, like uh, V for Vendetta. Take that for instance. That movie's that comes into now, right? So take V for Vendetta. That got produced, but it, it wasn't very. It wasn't super graphic. You know, it's almost go back into the mindset uh, and and go with what the thoughts and, and 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 produce it like that instead of it's a new world order and all of a sudden, you know, the CCP and everybody's coming over with guns and we got you know take the civil war aspect out of it. And go more, 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 more uh, logically with it. I think it could be made uh, that way. Yeah, I was going to throw in there too. We can also, you know, not look at this as a film anymore. And you could actually, you, you could actually take Grey State and turn it into a game. Yeah, a well, game. Probably, probably be probably. Yeah, yeah probably. Be, yeah, you you could do that. That that's how a lot of movies start started as games too. It's you know, documentary. 
<laughs> and, and, yeah. and you know, there, there's a lot in the, in the um, independent uh, indie film or indie game industry right now where I've seen just this new, I mean, segue, but it's, it's a way to get them out there. And I just saw what they're, what they're capable of doing with the, the new um, uh, Unreal Engine uh, 5 where they made a first person shooter that looks so realistic that people can't tell it's a game because what was the name of the game again um it's it's it doesn't it doesn't have a working title just yet it's just one level but this guy's been working on this game for like the last three years and i mean it's it, I'll, I'll send you guys the link of, of it because i just i just discovered it but the new unreal engine allows you to not have polygon counts for your models they're they're, they're millions upon millions of polygons so what this has done for us is it allows us to create these environments that are so lifelike that it's like you're looking at real footage. And these people were watching it and it's like a handy cam type footage that the way the gun reacts and the way he fires it, it's so realistic. I was like, imagine being able to take Grey State just the way David wrote it, just the way he wanted to produce it as a film, put it into a game was like an open world type you know, situation and give people like side quests, the actual mission, and then direct it not only as you know the gray state work in david's murder into it with all the facts and Unreal yeah, there you go fact. exactly you know start start kind of toward the end of his military service he quits he has an idea he goes in he starts producing this stuff the other thing too is you know you get alex jones jordan peterson um and uh rfk jr you know you got the pandemic and vaccines rfk jr you got Jordan Peterson, who goes against every narrative. And uh, you have, uh, who's the other one I said? Um, uh, well, anyway, but you know, like, you know, Alex Jones, whatever I'm saying. Is that, yeah, yeah, but try to get those people involved in a project and, and cover all aspects of it and take out some little bit of the violence and stuff. And, um, you know, maybe, you know, go, go, go from there. I mean, you know, that's a great idea. The, the game, you know, start off as a game. No one's going to stop that game. game. No one... I, I, I was going to say if Miss Kim, if she would actually play it, that'd be rad. <laughs> Let's get rich and buy an island somewhere away from all this craziness oh, from no. a game. But see, and David's character could be in an alliance and a horde because he's on both sides of, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> he would be horde going against the, the right. side of I mean, you, you could add all kinds of different aspects into this. So, you know, a leveling system, you could add in weapons, you can add in, you know, when when you're engaging with a character you you have multiple options to choose from and what you respond with like you know it could be an inquisitive question about the the situation or which direction to go or different options kind of like what horizon zero dawn gives you or a choose your own adventure book from like the 70s like if you choose this aspect it'll take you in this direction to the story and you can get alternate endings kind of like what they did in heavy rain back on playstation 3. Oh. Yeah. Okay, and we need to, you know, throw this little caveat in there. All right, um, Danny August Mason, Sean Wright, and all you other people, you can't take this idea. <laughs> it's our idea. You cannot copyright. Right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it does not belong to you. Right. I mean, I, I, well, what? They think they think it does. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, if I could reach out to some of the people I know who are still in the industry. And, and I see if they'd be interested in, in, in just doing a side project like this, maybe design a level and throw some, some characters in there. And uh, awesome. I mean, if you guys would be interested, I would love to see something like that because the power of video games is that you're hitting about, I mean, what is it? In 2016 alone, gamers spent 3 billion hours online. All right. And, and I mean, if you want to talk about something that's, bigger than Hollywood, the game industry is bigger than Hollywood. You don't Our, want to know how much I play. <laughs> you know, no, I mean, <laughs> not as that many hours, but I mean, I mean, just on Call of Duty alone, like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 that, you know, has come out in season three, I put in almost eight days into that game. And it's like, you know, these are people who are, are 
super nerds. We're not just nerds. We're super nerds. We're, we're the type of guys that like, we'll sit there and we'll look at every nuance of the game, like from light refraction to how characters move to how their articulation of words to the animation of the weapons. I mean, now you're getting into my, my, my niche. Well, I could talk about this forever, but I would love to have see that happen to see David's vision come to life. Oh, yeah. I, I'm telling you, seriously, I would play. I mean, right now I on World of Warcraft, I think I have like eight eight or nine characters that are all level 70 they're they're maxed they're <laughs> and if you know anything that's a lot of gameplay that's a yeah. lot of time oh, yeah. that's a lot of rage <laughs> and just because we're gamers doesn't mean we won't knock your ass out in real life either oh exactly yeah. right <laughs> yeah i'm i'm known for having a yeah i uh, I, 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 ask questions like yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of feel like Catherine has a great right hook. That's all I'm going to say. On that. <laughs> Not that I've ever experienced it, but she just gives me that vibe. Well, no, I'm a nice person. No, I'm sure. But if you're push, push come to shove. Yeah. You can yeah, exchange gamer dads and play some time. That'd be great. <laughs> I haven't played World of Warcraft in a long time, but I'd love to get back on that and start that again. It'd be so much fun. Well, but, uh, I mean, David. Yeah, David talked about gaming, and he talked about yeah. making like a gray state, a gray state um, type of a game, and so it's interesting. Um, did Did David ever talk to you about any gaming thing? Anything? Nothing like no, that. No, that's just something I just popped. That just popped into my head just right now with with the the technology that we have. I mean. Nice. Uh, Unreal, the Unreal Engine is free. You can download it for free and you can work with it. You just have to pay for certain aspects of it. Unreal and, Engine. Yeah, the Unreal Engine 5. And you just have to have a computer that can support it now. I mean, I wish I had <laughs> I wish I had that right now. But gee whiz, I, I would jump on that. And, you know, actually, I do have a, a Shadow PC. Um, it's, a, it's a full-fledged gaming PC that I, I, I stream from in a data center. And I have access to a gaming PC. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start working on that. Yeah. yeah. And now, now can, I'm going to say a, a bad word only because it, w there has to be a character and the character's name has to be the motherfucker. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. And those who know the case know who that is. I'll, 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 we'll, we'll call him, uh, you know, T -T -F TMS. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we'll just, we'll just call me Prometheus. Yeah, you know, patch on a fucking, you know, a biker jacket, you know, yeah. like that. Maybe Sean Reichel's run. I'm Sean motherfucking right. So it has to be the motherfucker. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. I've never had a chance to be on a show with him. That's got to be the villain. I'm a bad influence. That's got to be the Bowser of the Super Mario. <laughs> Oh, man. That's, that's funny you mentioned it because I, I, I came up with an idea that I pitched to Activision a few years ago that, like, every time you're in multiplayer and you, you get a kill, like, you can change the sound effect that, that it does when you, you get you get the kill. Like, it's a Mario, like, coin, or it's, like, the Sonic coin, or, like, you know, or, you know, got you, motherfucker, like, you know, <laughs> Jackson. People I'm hearing, so no, I'm hearing Sean's that. character every time Sean would get hit, he'd be going, ow! Yeah, right. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're way off topic. Uh, no. I know. I was expecting Eric to be Mike's like off anybody topic. has final thoughts five hours later. <laughs> <laughs> that was my final thought. I was getting ready to let up a promo. <laughs> <laughs> about an hour ago. Oh my God. <laughs> I truly appreciate being able to be on this panel, guys. I look forward to doing any other podcast with you, and I will send you all the information I have in those other messages. Uh, and and I'm going to pursue this game idea. I think it would be a fantastic I, I do too. way to showcase Hello. this story. So uh, I'll, I'll get together with you guys. I'm, I'm excited right now. Awesome. <laughs> so I appreciate you guys having me, and I look forward to it next time. Thank you, brother. Um, any final words, Matt? I guess that was Matthew's final oh, words, no, right? I'm just I'm just <laughs> no, I, I mean, if you have it, because I want to, I want to go around the panel and uh, get some final thoughts, some final words here. So, Matthew, um, you know, again, thank you so much for joining us. I hope to have you a part of more of our shows here, and um, 
any final thoughts, any final words? I get more more questions every time I have you on. I've only had you on twice, so I get a lot of questions here. But um, we're, we're going to get a lot of more questions. Uh, what is this thing? Oh, he talked about this. Oh, he talked about this rank. Well, what is this rank? I don't know. I, didn't, <laughs> I have no idea what it is, but I can write it down and I can ask him later on. I'd be happy um, to have any questions for you, but if I can leave with one final thought, it would be this. Is yes. that yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That's why Yahweh made it the present. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Great rest of your day. <laughs> thank you, my friend. All right, Catherine, um, any final words, any final thoughts here? Um, not really. <laughs> I'm kind of still stuck on the L, um, but yeah. Um... <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, just, you know, what I am grateful for. Okay, I do have something to say. Oh, who would have thought? Um, <laughs> I am grateful for people like Stephen and for Matthew, you know, and even for Eric and, and everybody else who has had the courage to come forward and to state, you know, the obvious. And, you know, regardless of what it could or could not mean for them personally. And, you know, they're all doing this for truth, not for accolades and not for anything else, but because they have a love of the truth. And I just want to say thank you, because without all of these people, I'm not sure where we would be. But as of right now, I think as far as the case goes, we're in a we're in a really good place. So thank you. Thank you, my friend. Always appreciate. Yeah, thank you. Thoughts here. Um, let's go to Stephen. Stephen, do you have any final thoughts, any final things you want to say before we shut this one down? No, I do, Greg. You know, it's even regarding my book, Ultimate Prey, on Amazon. Yes, sir. That, 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 was, that was a case and somewhat similar to this where the law enforcement narrative was uh, a totally, you know, 180 degrees the other way. And we were citizens and bounty hunters and PIs and went after this case and I wrote a book about it. And even though they didn't convict and sentence Kerry Stainer for the for the crimes along with other people, he was a you know, lone killer, let's say. But um, we went after the truth and um, and I, I think that the, the court of public opinion believes us, just like with the Crowley case, you know, you're, you're fighting city hall on this thing, you know? And just like with the Yosemite murder case, uh, the FBI was involved and discounted me on that case. And uh, it, years later, I got word, and I even talked to Nick Rossi, who was special agent in charge out of Sacramento, in so many words a few years ago, said I was right. And I think, you know, I shouldn't say, I think I know we're right on this thing. And we're going against the law enforcement narrative, and, and there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, resistance for people to listen to that like Kenneth Maines and all these other guys. But I say we keep plugging along, and I think eventually uh, somebody's going to have to do something about this case. Well, yeah, I mean, we can. people can use your book as a study guide for other cases. This is a big, big case. You, you sure. have actually, you know, you've dealt with some of these things. People have said things to you that led you to the Yosemite murder case that led you to say wait a minute maybe there are some other suspects here i mean right. th th that happened all of that happened Stephen, um, can you show the book again so i can and give me the name so i can write it yes. down sure it's uh that's what it looks like ultimate prey so it's, it's, ultimate on, it's prey. on amazon yeah it's, it's on, on amazon. amazon yep thank you but it, it kind of falls into the same narrative you know in a roundabout way of uh you know questioning law enforcement and, and their investigation i'll be ordering it right after the show oh <laughs> yeah hey, now, now you. you were a, you were a you were um this all this whole case really started with you Stephen, because you were uh just collecting on a bonds right you were a a bondsman right is that right right i bailed, I bailed a guy out of twelve county california and then the, the murders happened and his proximity of where his residence was to where they found bodies, his M.O., 
his previous, you know, half his life in prison for rape and drugs, everything else. And he was good to go. And when I go to Alabama, uh, they have one suspect. When I get out of there, they now name nine suspects. And my 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 uh, two day stint in Alabama, when we caught him jumping on bond, it went from you know. What's his name? Not, What's uh, his Paul name? Paul Can- Paul okay. Candler Jr. Okay. So it went from the narrative, and I you know I I, I brief uh, detectives in California that I'm going to go to Alabama arrest this guy. And the FBI calls me that night in my hotel room. They follow me back. And the, FBI. Me yeah, the, the FBI. Yeah, the FBI. Yeah, they quit handing out water posters. And that night at midnight when we kick his house, the deputies in Jefferson County, Alabama, have the wanted poster uh, in their back pockets and inform me that my guy is now the number one manhunt in Alabama. All within 48 hours. How does that happen? How did, you know? how, yeah, yeah, they got it all figured out. <laughs> They they look through a window and boom, it's all it's all done. They got it all figured yeah. out. So yeah. how did they how does that I mean, is there anything that Paul Candler said to you that led you to think that maybe what everyone, what the public thought about the Yosemite crime scene murders, the Yosemite site scene murders, that there were that this guy may have been involved. Did he say anything specific to you when you were talking to him? And Paul now you're, you're in my wheelhouse too, uh, working for the DNR. <laughs> oh, you would love this case, Eric. You would yeah. love this case. Yeah, it, Eric. Eric, if you haven't looked into the Yosemite site, see your see your murder. Um, if you haven't looked into the Carrie, is it Carrie Stanler? Is that Carrie Stanler? Yeah. So I mean, if you haven't looked into that, um, I mean this this book is it's well, you such know what. A- it, it, you know, Eric, it still plays because I just did a Hulu deal last year, and this happened in 1999. Why is Hulu still interested, or anybody, 22, 23 years later, right? Joe Bonet Ramsey, you haven't heard about that thing in a couple of years. And then uh, three weeks ago, uh, FBI agent Jeff Reinick uh, did a podcast with Emily Campagno on Fox. So why why is this case still being brought up if it was solved? Did you just say Joe Bonet Ramsey case? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, but it, it, this, this is, this is, even, mm. this has even gone past that yeah. with, with the interest in, 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 in um, um, uh, media groups and production companies still talking about this case. Why, why after twenty three years? Well, and 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 this is all uh, indirectly tied to the Stephen to the uh, story that ev- that everybody knows. I I know my first name is Stephen. Correct. That's what. It's, that's it's, what. Yeah, Good. that's the backstory of my story with his brother, exactly. And I just shared it in the chat, folks. Uh, the link is in the chat where you can go to Amazon and purchase Ultimate Prey and learn some truth. Yeah, and if you want to yeah. know what it was that Candler said to Stephen, you have to get the book and then read <laughs> chapter 20. Oh, oh there you go. No, no. No. No, Ken, when we when we when we when we caught you know, we had a forty eight hour manhunt. It was a statewide manhunt, and we actually, I, I mean, I like I said, I ended up fighting with him out of the hotel room uh, in 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 Fulldale, Alabama, and we arrest him, and we you know took him to the hospital because it was a little fight. Uh, is that when the hospital in the hospital, uh, he told my partner he felt sorry for those women in Yosemite, and before before that eight year, eight hours earlier when we hit the house with Jefferson County, his girlfriend. But we, my partner and I, were the FBI. I mean, you know that. Like I said, not too many people run from California to Alabama. It usually goes the other way. <laughs> so yeah, no, it, it, you know, the writing was on the wall. Uh, but um, when you read the book, and and and, and it, you know, it 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 ends. It's a it's a nice solid ending, uh, where uh, you know the, the law enforcement was saying that you know Steve, you you were right. Yep. Yeah, and that's all part of here, chapter 20. And just to give you guys a quick little snippet, it says, tell me, man, what did he say? He said he thought we were feds and wanted to question him about the Yosemite murders. Rick paused for effect. Then he said that he felt sorry for them. Them? I asked with a with a uh I asked, feeling a twist in my guts. The girls, Rick answered. Great book, guys. You gotta get it. Hey, gotta thank you. Gotta get that. My biggest three fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm telling anyway. you, that's uh, that's just a, a great book. So obviously um, there was something that 
drew you to the David Crowley case that was similar or was it just oh, uh, oh, one, one, one hundred percent spot on, you know what? Uh, say same narrative, you know, which was the wrong narrative. Uh, easy, easy to close the book for law enforcement, suicide, homicide, you know, 90% of the sheep out there will believe that. And you know what? I mean, they just caught five LAPD guys selling guns to the cartel at the border here in San Diego. Okay. So, you know what? Law enforcement has its problems. They had their problems back then. And, you know, when we got 51 CIA guys signing off on a laptop too. So, you know what? <laughs> it's out there, people, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta pave your own road, you know, and go with, go with what you really believe. Go with your gut. That's right. All right, my friend. Um, Eric, any final final things you want to say here, or else we'll shut this one down here? Catherine, anything? I know Catherine. What an amazing show. Um, <laughs> the two guests, wow, they should be part of the regular broadcast for sure. Um, yeah. I have to close out. If you want, I'll present it. Um, make sure it sounds okay. It's a little tribute yeah. to David I, I made here. Um, Hopefully it doesn't get your station nuked. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. You uh, never know. So <laughs> Thanks. Eric, I want to say, Eric, you have your own yeah. podcast, right? I used to. Now I'm banned from YouTube. So Greg's oh, taking okay. a big risk to even have me on. Yeah, I, oh, I think well, Eric well, is well, on his 37th it. ban right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I've been banned and kicked off, but I, I cannot even create a station now. They don't let oh, me. my God. Well, Greg, we'll use your station and we'll do something else. You got it, my friend. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, thank you all. And God bless you all. And Thanks, we sir. will be back here very soon here. We will continue for justice for David Crowley and family. Expect me. Welcome to the resistance. You got to share. Buddy. I know your word. Honey. Believe me, there is. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Get him back. There's ain't no question about that. We'll get him back. That's just all there is to it. And hey, you want to know another thing? I'm going to be a